All right. Where am I? There we go. <clears throat> this is a mic test. And I think everything's okay. Uh, I've done my last Twitter reminders that there was a stream going on. And now I've done all I can. I'm just going to jump right into it and have a good time. So, this is my um, list of uh, not magic items necessarily, but uh, items for purchase by the player characters in my campaign, which has been called New Year. Uh, it's a sci fi campaign, uses Dungeons and Dragons as the base rule set. We use Hyperlanes as like the, the modifier, which is a fan made, not fan made, it's a original content creation. Um, I highly recommend checking it out on the guild, DM Guild, I think that's where I got it. Um, but it was a good price. PDF came with a bunch of uh, new um, spells, which they renamed into Gambits for the sake of sci-fi thematicness. Um, and these are just items that fit more with the sci-fi theme. Um, so I'm going to go into it. I've lost my license for Microsoft Word when my computer crashed and Microsoft destroyed all my files. But I do have WordPad, which is okay. Uh, it's okay. It's all right. Um, so we're just going to jump right in here, starting with a new heading. Uh, for the most part, I just organized things in this gigantic PDF based on when I added them. So more recent stuff is at the top, and then old stuff is at the bottom. And that's more, it's not really just because I'm lazy, but it is because I'm lazy. But the big issue is um, it's so that when the player characters read the PDF, they can just see the stuff that's new right at, right at the top. And they don't have to go searching for it. If it was alphabetical, they'd never know when I added new things. So this is just the way that's going to be for for now. Uh, maybe I'll <laughs> figure out some way to organize it later in the future. So sale items for and then whatever the hell today's date is, so seven twenty four, and then I put it actually in the year of the game, New Year, which takes place in the two hundred and fifteenth year of the modern era. Um, just to be cheeky, uh, really, I just uh, I it just makes me want to write two thousand fifteen. Um, and I am a big fan of writing in, like, charts, boxes. Um, it's just my style. Date and time, insert objects. So now we're going to have to figure out how to insert a box. Uh, in a <laughs> word bad. And if that's not possible, then I'll just ignore it. Um, but I, th I think I thought it was possible. Insert objects. Hmm. Open document, to do a drawing, formula, spreadsheet. That sounds right. That's a nasty wheel of death I got going here. Uh, okay. So, date and, date and time. That looks like a, a chart of, of some form. I've, I've lost control of WordPad. All right. Well, can we do this? Ah, what is old is new again. Look at that. There we go. We've generated for ourselves a nice little chart to work on. Uh, it just keeps things more organized for me. Easier to see, easier to understand. Uh, we have the price in the middle, which is uh, listed in credits, and then we have our little descriptions on the right, which I try to keep short, um, but it's just everything that needs to be in there is in there, whether it's suffer or long. The suffering means it's working. Yep, we're in there. Sorry, I've got the pop-out chat. Now I can actually see things. There we go. Why is your photo that creepy man? I don't like that creepy man. His smug aura disgusts me. All right, so first things first. This has been on my mind for a long while. Here, let me just rearrange the windows a little bit so that I can better see the chat. Hopefully, it won't it won't, it won't affect anything um, for the stream. You will be missing nothing, I promise. Uh, it do does not suit me. 
Um, can I also, I'm going to put the chat in the thing so you guys can actually see when it is I am getting my information. So what is this, a window? Uh, stand by, please. Uh, window capture this is going to be chat capture. And it's going to be the... Is it there? Oh, kind of. Uh, it's just black. Well, not very useful, I suppose. Well, forget about that. I also have to double check chat every now and then to make sure it's still working. <clears throat> okay. First things first, something that's been bothering me for a long while. Uh, Bunny, Swordsman, Chad. Chad is forbidden. Yep, fucking banned, but oh well. I don't know why YouTube chat. I, I had to get like a widget in order to get Twitch chat to work on streams. I don't know what I need to do with YouTube. I guess the whole point is that I'm streaming to YouTube, so it's just going to save it anyway. But it, it, whatever. Here we go. We're going to have holographic fabric. I've, had, I've done enough um, stalling here. And that's going to be around... Uh, we're going to start at 400 credits right now. Um, how I judge how much stuff should cost is entirely based around <laughs> do I want them to have it do I not want them to have it or do I want it to simply just be difficult to get um, they get paid around uh, 10,000 credits for every mission which is to say like every arc so every fifth session or so so they I, I try to make them ration their money it's not just like a constant flow in and out um, but I, I think that that's the way I'm going to do it for now so stuff that's like really like the the world will change if they purchase this thing. The way the gameplay will 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 be altered forever. Um, it needs to have at least three zeros at the end of it, starting starting around a thousand. Some of the stuff in here is truly ludicrous, just to show them like, hey, it's possible if you can just make the money for it. Um, but other stuff in here is like, oh, upgrades for their ship that they have. Uh, if they wanted to get a prison inside of their ship, for example, I feel like that would change the gameplay a little bit. So I put that at five hundred. See. Um, so we'll start with 400 on this one, and then we'll, we'll change things depending on how it goes. So holographic fabric. Um, in my setting, I've noticed a distinct dearth of a, 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 a magics, magics that are um, more traditional Dungeons & Dragons-esque, and I feel like that's sad, and I, I want to I change that. Um, so we're going to add a few more things in there that already exist in the setting. I just want to bring them to the forefront of the gameplay. So, um, for example, no illusion magic. It's not like you can cast sleep on one. This is a, a hard, a, not really a hard science setting, but it's a science setting that re everything requires some kind of explanation. So there's no real illusions. You can't, like, cast a mirror image or um, mage hand or anything like that. So we're going we're gonna to give the player something. Um, so we're going to have holographic fabric, which is just going to be a sheet of fabric no bigger than, say, like, what, five feet? Um, and that can, it's going to be specifically to enable illusions. So it's going to be the uh, sheet of fabric that can, uh, that displays a chosen image. Um, but it, assumingly, this is going to be something that the players, that in story, the characters would have like preloaded. Um, what I'm picturing is just kind of like a blanket, essentially, with a uh, little like, Bluetooth adapter on one of the corners. Um, and it's going to be completely transparent. Well, almost completely transparent. And facilitates the um, conjuration of illusions. And also convenient communication, I suppose, if you wanted to string it up on a wall and throw some uh, pictures up there, some movies, could do that too. It's up to the players. Uh, but my intention was this is something to lay out like a trap or throw into the air as some kind of like, um, as some kind of uh, misdirection. Uh, let's see here. Uh, but since it's an illusion, it's going to be like a spell. Thinking about holographic fabrics is as a general material as well. Yeah, these are things that are. Um, They've hit kind of like, not the end game, but they've hit the mid game where uh, a lot of things that appear in the store are these crazy technological feats uh, that aren't really prevalent in the rest of the universe. But they've made friends with people in high places, and I think that they deserve some special things because of that. 
Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna give it to him. And so this is uh, basically a fabric that works like a it's just like a TV screen. It's essentially a essentially a flexible screen. Um, and I think that this has a lot of story purposes in a variety of ways. I don't think that I want them to break, break their bank over it, so we're going to knock it down to 200 for now. Um, and I also think that there needs to be some kind of DC for people to see through this illusion. I don't think it should be difficult, but I also think that it should be left up to player skill. Uh, so we're going to say that the DC to see through the illusion is going is determined by... The, it's going to be determined by one of their modifiers. It's going to be determined by... Uh, they're, in this setting, it's called their Gambit casting modifier, uh, which is just the same thing as their spell casting modifier in Dungeons & Dragons. So for Nyx, for example, who's basically a wizard, it's going to be in her intelligence. Um, for our th resident thief, Aurelio de la Fuente, it's going to be his charisma modifier, I think, or p perhaps wisdom. I'm not quite sure which. He's like a rogue, but he also has some bardic things in there, so I think it's probably his charisma. Um, so what do we have here? Sheet of fabric number even five feet, so we've put a limiter on that. Uh, it displays a chosen image. So it's basically whatever they can set their mind to, they can put on it. It is almost completely transparent and facilitates the conjuration of illusions. Um, I put that in there to kind of let them know what my intention is, but if they have some other intentions, then that's fine too. I'm picturing something like they throw it on the ground and uh, make it look like a, like a pit, like a bottomless pit. Um, they fly it up through the air, they're like attached to a drone or something, and they, they put some kind of screen on it to make it look like a, a, a fireball charging towards someone. Um, those are some really basic things. Or an animal of some kind, they can lay it out like on a tree and have it like display like a giant tarantula or something like that, maybe try to scare someone. Um, but it's essentially the, it's going to be this world's equivalent of mirror, mirror image. Um, and I'm going to make it reusable. I, I want it to basically uh, b use a gambit, uh, use a, uses a gambit slot, which is a spell slot. And we're going to make it last for an hour. I can't imagine that the players will ever be in a situation where they need it to last for an hour. Uh, let's see. You could probably implement it as a sci-fi version of this magical item, glamour studded leather armor. I can send you a link if you want. Yeah, we'll get there. I don't want the, I don't want this to be a catch-all item um, because I want it to be. Uh... I'm just gonna make it whatever. It is. It's a five-foot piece piece of fabric, and if the players decide like I'm gonna cut a hole in it and I'm gonna turn it into a poncho, then like that's up to them. But I, um, I'm just gonna let them go with it. Um, glamorous studded leather armor. I've not heard of that, but I, th I think I, from the name alone, I think I might understand what that is. Um, uses a gambit slot to activate, lasts up to one hour. Yeah, and they're just gonna have to recover it. I, I imagine that this is a piece of equipment that they're just gonna have to keep on them, folded up. Um, and if they can recover it, then they can reuse it. Uh, but that's gonna be their job. And we're gonna save. So what else should we have here? We have a crazy sci-fi setting. It's not so crazy as to warrant like um, we don't have the force. Um, we don't have nano machines; um, those are too expensive. Um, but we do have uh, mechs. That has been a concession that I've made, and we also essentially have infinite power. This is a setting where uh, power and transportation is prevalent and easy and cheap. Um, however, the rest of technology has kind of been knocked down a bit. Uh, if you want to post the a link to glamorous studded arm, let it, let it, glamorous studded leather armor in the chat, you can. Uh, if it'll let you, I don't really know the rules on YouTube. I'd, I'd allow it, but I don't know if YouTube itself will. Um, so what do we what do we have here? What kind of spells have we wanted to add for a long while? I'd like to see more um, maneuverability stuff, but I think I already have like grappling hooks in here. Um, we have low level. Uh, <laughs> we have a jetpack in here. Um, it doesn't let me. Well, there's that, I guess. Uh, we have ammos in here. Yeah, it's unfortunate that it won't let us put fancy stuff in here. Ooh, let's put a corrosive in here. But I was thinking more like tech being used for multiple things. Listen, uh, when it comes to this setting, if they can find some weird piece of crap on this uh, sale list that I've put in, um, and they can think of some crazy, insane use for whatever it is that they've purchased, then, like, I'll, for the most part, yeah, they could just do it. They can just go and do whatever the hell they goddamn please. Um, I like that kind of attitude. I like that sort of, um, they make whatever they want to make. They make the most of their situation. Um, I would like to have a corrosive. Um, I've noticed that my uh, rogue really wants to break into a lot of things pretty much all the time. 
Um, and in that end, I'm going to facilitate that desire. And we're going to make this a consumable item. And consumable items, I try to keep under $100, uh, 100 credits. Uh, however, some stuff is a little bit more dangerous than others. Um, while wearing this armor, you gain a plus one to AC. You also use a bonus action to speak the armor's command word and cause the armor to assume the appearance of a normal set of clothing or some other kind of armor. Oh, uh, yeah, that's pretty interesting. Um, you decide what it looks like, color, style, accessories, but the armor retains its normal bulk and weight. Uh, yeah, it's just like a cosmetic thing. That's fun. Um, that sounds like something. Uh, yeah, that sounds like something that could probably done be done with this. Um... Oh, you know what? Speaking of, I was just about to say that you could put the holographic fabric over your clothing or whatever and do what you will with it, but then I'd ha probably have to... Um, I do like the idea of them... <laughs> I want my players to treat their toys carefully. Um, I want them to be able to break. So in that, to that end, I'm going to give this piece of equipment uh, HP. Uh, this equipment... Breaks. If it suffers, um, and then an what's a good average amount? Um, most handguns do about one d six damage. So let's do. Let's, we'll just give it six HP. So that way, if they get real unlucky, um, a goon of some kind can just like one shot their their favorite toy um, and break it. Uh, but for the most part, I just want them to get the thing shot at and have it maybe like get a few holes in it and just scare them. Um, but I don't want them to necessarily be uh, just losing 200 credits like every round as they keep trying to use cool new stuff. Uh, you just have the armor looks like the illusory appearance lasts until you use his armor uh, property again or remove the armor. No, okay, it's a cosmetic thing then. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of which, however, cosmetics. Um, in, in all games, everything's kind of balanced in their own ways. I think the three biggest ways to balance any kind of equipment in a video game is through uh, range. How, how long can something... What's the range on something's uh, effect? Like a, a spear versus a dagger. Different ranges. Um, how much damage they do and how fast they are like those are like combat things like that, that that trilogy right there that trio kind of decides how powerful something is anything that's specialized in one of those should be weak in one of the others or maybe average on one of them so it's a nice balance but there's other ways to balance things um in some games uh like dungeons and dragons that keep track of equipment load uh encumbrance you can make something heavy so it might be very powerful but just takes up a lot of space i think i have another holographic projector down there that was available to them at early levels um, but it was incredibly bulky and incredibly heavy, and, and they didn't buy it, and that was fine because I wanted it. I, I could picture like a one use for this thing, and it was like their level three. I, I didn't really want them to have the ability to conjure up holograms at their disposal, um, and I don't think even holograms even fully exist in this world. This is just like a fabric that it's just an LED fabric essentially. Um, so this is probably like the upgraded version of that thing from earlier. Um, and it doesn't weigh much. It's very easy. Uh, there's lots of ways to, to balance things. And one of the ways that I've been balancing some of the equipment in this setting is not only through strength of how useful it is, or cost, or weight even, uh, but how it looks. Because uh, I have some very nitpicky players when it comes to the appearance of their players, characters. <laughs> Which is totally fine. That is A-OK. -okay. I completely understand. I want my character to look a specific way too, whether it be good or for a certain aesthetic. But... What it essentially does is place another tool in my tool belt of balance. And so I know for a fact that I could put the strongest frickin' armor in the store for 1,000 credits. Um, but if I, if, I, if I put it in a description that it's made out of nail clippings, or even that it is made out of the, uh, an ugly, like, hunter's orange mixed with a little brown, like if the colors are off, I know that they won't like it. Ooh, I know that they won't like it. I do not have power gamers in my party. Mm -mm, no, oh, oh, I got all these RPers who are very focused on the appearance and the theme of their character, and that's fine. It gives me one more tool to use. It means that I can make some real powerful stuff, but make it a real stinker in the looks department, and then it truly is a test of character. Uh, so we're just going to have some basic corrosive. This is going to be a one-time use item. Uh, no possibility of recovery. Uh, Aurelio will wear it, it's fine. Yeah, I, I do, I, my rogue is a, um, well, even he is got a, he's just opposite of my other players, where all my, my other two players are more, um, 
I would say Nyx is like, well, she's she's got a she likes to look a certain way. She just tries to act comfortable. Uh, the character she dresses in a comfortable way, but she she and she uh, can be enticed um, by fancy things sometimes. And I got Abram, who's like a space pirate, and he's got his own style too. But I think he's a bit of a fashionista at heart. Ah, I took a sip of my drink there, and then we have Aurelio, who's a some kind of horrifying trash panda. Um, he's a raccoon with some alligator skins um, attached to him. Um, but even he, I think, I think that's part of his thing. Like I think that. I could balance it the other way, where I, I say, like, this armor is sleek, black, tight, dressed like a tuxedo. Like, it's so absolutely above and beyond any kind of fashion thing. Like, it's it was designed by the Ralph Lauren of this setting. And I think that that would stop him from wearing it. <laughs> I think that that would postpone his ability to put it on. Um, Aurelio is, yeah, Aurelio is a monster. He can, he can wear whatever he wants. He's unstoppable. So how do we treat a cur- I want this essentially, I want this item to be, to eat through a lock, to eat through a door, to eat through a window. Um, but I, I need to put some kind of limit on it, I think. Um, but I don't really have a way to have hit points for walls, doors, or windows. Um, everyone is happy, wear whatever. Uh, this is why the glorious <laughs> is necessary, everyone. See, and that's why I can never put it in my game. <laughs> cause, cause I cannot let my players be truly happy. Um, they need to, there must always be a balance. There must always be a teeter-totter of form versus function. Um, and I think that they're going to strike their own good balance. Um, the holographic LED fabric, if, if one of them was like, well, could I make pants out of it? I'd probably be like, no, because they're, it's like a rigid screens. Like it doesn't quite bend that well. It, it wouldn't bend so much as to facilitate like the human joints. It would probably flow in the wind. Um, but I don't think that it'd be able to bend around an elbow or something like that. Um, there are rules for durability in 5e. Yeah, but I don't want to, I don't really want, see, the thing is, is that I don't have rules for HP on walls and windows and stuff like that, not because I'm I'm uh, lacking in my resources, but rather because I'm, I'm lacking in my desire for them. I don't really want to have to keep track of <laughs> HP for doors, walls, windows, and what have you, so I think I'll have to put some kind of I uh, high powered industrial. I like to add a little bit of flair to these descriptions. Not enough to make them confusing, uh, but enough to give um, context to the items. Like I want my players to see these items and go, yes, these items could exist in this setting already. They're not something that has just been made up for the sake of this video game. All, all of these items has been invented by someone for a purpose that wasn't just them. Like these holographic LED fabrics, like this is stuff for this is entertainment purpose. This is used in the backgrounds of of TVs to make um, TV sets on like the late night show um, have some more flair to them. They're, this is this is decoration. This is stuff that when it's not meant to hold up to scrutiny. It's something that someone might get fooled in the heat of the moment. Uh, but it's not like um, it's not active camo. We're not doing any kind of Metal Gear Solid shenanigans quite yet, though. Metal Gear Solid S clothing that does just blend in straight with the environment, like camouflage, is now something that I think I am going to add. Um, and it will be, it, let me tell you, it will cost significantly more money than 200C. Um, but in the swordsman, you can, what is going on? There are rules, you can eyeball it for the most part. The rules are there and are noted. He uses discretion, I think is what he's saying. Yeah, I just use some, I use some discretion. I, but I do want to put in some kind of, um, some kind of warning. Uh, high-powered industrial solvent. Um, if I say that it is, I do have certain metals in this game. I can really just do the Minecraft approach, where if like if I make a if I make something, if I if there's like a town or like a city or like a some kind of complex where like I I just don't want them to eat through the wall with their corrosive that I know that they have, I could just say it's made of that one material that can't be eaten by the corrosive and just be done with. It's made of bedrock. It's made of obsidian. <laughs> I can just so I think I'm gonna I think I'll do that. Um, a high-powered industrial solvent that can eat through most mundane materials. I was going to say metals, but I think, well, I, I mean, uh, lots of things, like materials within, or I'm going to say minutes, because that's another thing, is that some stuff I do want them to be able to eat through with this, possibly, uh, but it's just going to be a case of maybe it takes more time. Maybe it takes a minute to eat through, uh, like, this wood structure. Um, 
but it's gonna take a it's gonna take maybe like I don't know five minutes six minutes for for like a, a solid iron um, and what he wants just like how artists learn anatomy and theory so they can better use it their own purpose and style <laughs> yeah we're we're taking the stylistic approach I suppose um, now the real limit on this is the hole the hole that it can create so I think the hole that it's going to be able to create by the end of this is going to be around I'm gonna say two feet. I think I think I'm gonna go with like maybe a foot and a half, two feet, and I think that that's enough to warrant reaching a hand in and grabbing something, like uh, reaching through the door and unlocking the doorknob from the other side. Um, but I have a particularly tiny rogue um, whom will probably be like, "Can I now crawl through the hole that I've just made?" And I will say, "Yes, make an acrobatics roll." Um, and if he rolls really well, then he succeeds. And if he rolls really badly, he does not. Uh, and if he rolls like kind of okay, I mean, he gets through, but I think he gets some corrosive on him, uh, and it's gonna burn him. It's gonna do some damage. Um, so the hole created is no bigger than two feet, but can vary depending on the material. And because this is a consumable, we're going to keep it below 100. Um, I don't think that this is any kind of... I, I feel like this can also be used as like a one-time use free lockpick. Because uh, um, I've been pretty harsh on the lockpicks because I don't want the rogue to just be like willy nilly lockpicking everything that is lockpickable. I've made it so that if he fails, um, the lockpick breaks and he has to buy more. Um, but he's recently acquired some better lockpicks that like they only break if it's like a critical failure or something like that. Because I just don't want to have to keep track of it and I don't want him to have to keep track of it. And like they're not with stores very often. A lot of animals, rodents, I think, cats to a degree, have a particularly collapsible skeleton for squishing through small spaces. Um, yeah, and Aurelia de la Fuente is definitely part cat. Um, more like probably rodent, perhaps some kind of sly raccoon, uh, as well as alligator. Hmm, what else could we possibly add to this? I don't think anything needs to be used. It's a one-time use item. Uh, it can't make a hole bigger than two feet. Um, and I said that it eats through most mundane materials within minutes. Um, I, I guess I'll add that I feel like that implies a disclaimer that there are some materials out there that it can't necessarily eat through, at least not without some kind of exceptional circumstances. Um, but we'll probably just add that in there, uh, that there's some materials are simply too strong. And we'll give an example, uh, like dark steel. Dark Steel is a um, the fictional name for a real-world material that I keep unnamed for the sake of fantastical imagination. Um, that's what the orbital elevators and several other large structures in space are made from in this setting. Um, it's a very real material um, that exists in the real world, but I just simply call it Dark Steel because the people in this setting don't necessarily have a full grasp of the technology at their disposal. Um, and so I like this idea that they, they still name things on a more mundane level, and uh, it's steel, well, steel's bright and shiny, so, and this is not, it's much, it's much dimmer, this is more of like a matte thing, kind of looks like graphite, we're going to call it dark steel. They just name it like it is. Uh, it's just the way things go. Um, what else do we have here? We have a few gambits already in this game that are spells that almost everybody can use. Um, and I think I need to talk with with Abram about his stuff because he was a class in the game that could use gambits, but now he's not. But I want him to be a gambit caster, so I think I'm just gonna give him gambits, and then he can just cast them using one of his uh one of the uh, tertiary stat modifiers, so like wisdom, charisma, um, or intelligence. I think I'm gonna pick for him though. I I don't want him to be good at everything, so I want to make sure that I tax his stats a little bit. He's already a good fighter in general. Uh, in 3.5, there was an epic feat called Escape Artist. You could pass through a space smaller than your head. That's insanity. I don't like that. <laughs> That's uncomfortable. <laughs> um, in this, ooh, actually, in this, in Hyperlanes, um, one of the gambits that was created for the game by the original designers is actually. Um, Oh, it's not a gambit, but it's a skill. Uh, they're one of the classes that the rogue could specialize into. Um, they could specialize into either a gunslinger or um, bounty hunter or like a, a saboteur. Uh, and that third one had a skill where you can, it's, it's just straight up, it's like level 18 or something. So like, I don't think my players are ever going to see it. But it was like, if you are in a situation that you need to get out of, you, sim you can simply escape. Like you are guaranteed to be able to escape any situation and find a safe space that will be guaranteed to be safe to you for 10 minutes so it was essentially like um i imagined that the story ramifications were the rogue like 
feels the wall and they realize like that part of it is is not fully like solid and they're able to scrape away some of the wallpaper and break down some of the uh the sheetrock behind it and find their way into the ducts and then they're able to find a small like storage closet that keeps them safe for like 10 minutes it's just like a guaranteed break essentially but it it's all it's also sounds like this feat escape artist or it's essentially they get out of dodge for free um so what kind of items do we have here? Uh, there's been a few stuff. I've been trying to get more fantasy elements into here, so I've been thinking about adding some straight-up more mystical-sounding things, but really just as technology in disguise. Uh, I don't know who it was that said that any kind of advanced form of technology can just, like, it's just magic. <laughs> Sufficiently advanced technology is just magic, and that's kind of what we're, we're dealing with at some points here. But we were just talking earlier about holographic fabric being really cool, the idea of, like, doing some Metal Gear Solid 4 Guns of the Patriots. Uh, solid snake-esque camouflage um so let's get some of that business up in here let's get some reactive fabric and that is going to do what i think the players think that it's going to do and what it's going to do is it's not going to be it's not going to be the glamorous set of metal armor because we are doing a kind of um more realistic setting i don't think that it's uh they can't just like um holograms aren't real holograms don't exist in the setting but stuff close to them exists so like fabric that can display images and can be uh, manipulated. Uh, I mean, I feel like that's basically a hologram. And that it, that's even better than a hologram because that, that actually has physical nature. Like, you can whip somebody with that. Or, or not trying to do damage, but I mean, like, it, it can exist in the real world. You can't just, like, face through it. And I feel like that's almost better. So this reactive fabric, what it's going to be, is mechanically it's going to be advantage on a stealth check. And I, this is a high, we're gonna make a let's let's go big. We're gonna make this a hefty price. We're gonna we're gonna leave it at five hundred for now. And it's just gonna be advantage on stealth checks for one hour. And what we're gonna have here is a description, but that's the the bottom line. Literally, I, I try to leave the bottom line to to be the actual like okay, but what can it do? And it's like okay, well, what can it do? It can create a hole no bigger than two feet depending on the material. What does this do? It gives you advantage on stealth checks for one hour. So we're looking at here is a, um, I'm feeling a cat suit, but I want the players to be able to kind of decide for themselves like how this represents itself, but I'm picturing some kind of a, a wearable material of some kind. Um, that's, that it's simply, it's color and texture can change. What is the what is the possessive of a noun? It's not a, mater a wearable material whom a wearable a wearable material that that's that's this is already too confusing. Um, that can change. Which thank you, which can change. I'm high on painkillers right now, so I am not operating in my best. A wearable material which can change color and texture. Um, to, a minor, uh, to a minor degree. Like, I don't want the uh, players to, to look at this and assume that, like, um, I don't think it can mirror, like, skin texture very well, but the point is, like, they're, not, they're, deal, they're, they're in some brush, um, and they can just have part of their like uh, their clothing. Like the, this would be like maybe an undergarment of some kind, like a cat suit worn under their normal clothing. Maybe they need to take off their jacket so that this thing is a, has a um, prevalence to the eye. And it just changes color. Uh, it, it puts on some disruptive pattern, some kind of camouflage. Um, uh, and basically just give advantage on stealth checks for, for one hour. Um, I think this is going to be like a gambit kind of thing now. It's going to be some kind of consumable. Uh, I've noticed that my players really haven't been using their their, their spell slots, essentially, very often, um, unless they're in combat, and I'm, I'm trying to change that. And most of the situations that they've been in have just been solved through either their own quick thinking, um, using items, or their <laughs> or their bard's charisma, ch charisma stat. Um, and I really want to change that. I want them to have more agency in, in changing the world around them through the use of their own skills, their own items, their own their own quick thinking, um, and but more like their pre-planning. Like I want them to look at the store, um, their requisitionable supplies, and say like, well, how could this be useful in the future? Um, I want to see more of that that pre-planning. And they don't have to play that way, but if I, I want the option to be there. Um, so this is going to be reactive fabric, wearable material, which can change color and texture to a minor degree. 
to match the surrounding environment. Um, I don't know if I'm going to add this to the description, but I'm picturing like some kind of a basic camera that's just like attached to the back of um, back of the garment that just like takes a quick it takes a picture of the surrounding environment and it just analyzes it for like what color like uh, are we in a green environment a tan environment blue environment um and then it just makes the uh the fabric it maybe changes the temperature of it it's made out of it's got some it's got some liquid in between the layers that reacts to different temperatures um and it adjusts accordingly to to make the colors change like a chameleon um At, and we're going to make this a uh, at the cost of... This is essentially a gambit, but it's also a material, so at the cost of one gambit slot. Um, and I'm leaving most of these as just like a level one for now, because I don't feel like my party has uh, got very high-level gambit slots. And even if they did have high-level gambit slots, I don't think, like, advantage on a, a stealth check is really is that big a deal. It will even knock down the price a bit of these items because I feel like uh, these two items do very similar things. The difference is one can one's attached to your body uh, whereas the other one is not. And I feel like this is a this is something that was more camouflage based um, whereas the holographic LED was my intention to be a trick, an illusion of some kind, um, a misdirection, whereas this is a reactive fabric uh, garment designed to not have to, to it's a not being seen in the first place is uh, the intentions here so this is actually meant to be seen holographic LED fabric that's something that's meant to be seen um, whereas this is not and I feel like that is enough uh, distinction to warrant two item lists um, and we'll, uh, we'll, knock, we'll knock this down even more but I'm a little concerned uh, for a while there Abram had some skills that were like camouflage based um, and I think that they still can be camouflage based. Uh, is advantage too strong for a for a gambit slot? I don't think so. Not for a gambit slot. If this was just like a consumable item, I think that'd be very powerful. But for a gambit slot, I think that's fair. From what Clues told me about the campaign, some James Bond gadgets might be perfect fit. Yeah, we've already got some crazy James Bond gadgets in here, especially if they're going incognito. I don't know if they're still worried about that. Laser pen. Um, yeah, it's just, uh, I might be, I might seem like I'm actually kind of holding back in the crazy variety, but you have to understand that this is actually, this item list, I think, has well over, like, 200 items on it already that are already these truly insane, <laughs> truly insane, um, items here, and some of them are quite powerful if they just haven't jumped on yet, and that's another thing, is I don't want to add too many things, because there's actually, there's so much stuff in here already that I think that they've had their eye on they've just been saving money for and so i don't want to put in too much competition what am i talking about of course i want there to be more competition um i think my favorite's still the bone saw that was a joke weapon that i threw in there it just wanted to, if one if they wanted to go bloodborne on somebody's ass or just like have a wild time as the medic from team fortress they could just buy to a, a bone saw as like a weapon to use and i i made it like a joke weapon so i was like i'll give it 2d4 damage um, but then I realized after doing some maths that 2d4 damage is actually quite considerable to the point where it's almost on par with a one-handed longsword. <laughs> so that throwaway joke weapon was now exists in the ether as a formidable, uh, formidable thing indeed. Can we do a laser pen? What, what, what would a laser pen be? I feel like a laser pen would just function as like a, um, a lock pick, maybe. Except it's like concealable, for the most part, kind of. I don't know. It could do damage, I suppose. Lasers are kind of hard to come by in the setting too, just because I'm trying to keep it realistic. It's like um, it's like if for for five decades our world just focused entirely on like uh, just space travel and transportation, um what would happen but everything else is kind of left at like base level like they don't have they don't have computers that are capable of crunching like terabytes of information yet or anything like that but they do have gundams essentially they've they got big old fucking mechs uh, but those are grandfathered in it's a whole story there's a, there's a lot of uh, background history to the setting that excuses all the crazy insane stuff that i'm dealing with i swear um i do want a laser pen though I'll, i'm just gonna i'm just gonna write down laser pen It'll come to me. Some ideas about that will come to me. I don't want it to be something damaging, because if it's too damaging, they're just going to use the laser... Some of them will be, feel pressured to use the laser pen instead of their signature weapons. Um, 
but if it's not useful enough, they're never going to spring for it. So maybe we can. Maybe it's like a one-time use thing. Maybe it's a seventy dollars. Keep it under. Keep it under. Uh, keep it under a hundred for a consumable. I feel like that's a good, just like a pick kind of thing. I don't really want to shoot a laser that's like thirty feet or something like that. I don't want people sniping with a laser pen. Um, but maybe like a small blowtorch, like a tungsten blowtorch. That's just like a, a one-time use. Uh, it could require a recharge. Eh, maybe, maybe, maybe it's a recharge. Then it's like a one-time, one-a-day thing. At that point, though, why don't I just say it's a gambit slot? Another issue that I've run into in my campaign is that some of my players have so many items, um, and I don't. It's hard to remember when you've used something or when you haven't used something or when something's consumable versus when it's not consumable or how many charges do you have left of something um so i've been trying to keep everything to either a you can use it permanently it's a gambit slot or it's just a one-time use thing um because i felt like those three are already so much to to deal with it's already hard enough to figuring out how many gambit slots have been used in a day uh, at least with my players, maybe other maybe other people don't have as much difficulty. I've already got so much stuff on my mind. I have to remember how many gambit slots my enemies here are using as well. Spell slots, gambit slots, same thing. One equates to the other. Laser pen, we're gonna have it in there. Would it, maybe like advantage? Maybe like a, I don't want to just be like a numbers thing though. Let's just put it in. Let's just say it's a small it's a small tungsten blowtorch for fixing or breaking. I'm gonna leave the one-time use clause on there for now, though, just because I just don't feel comfortable. I just don't know. I just don't know. A laser pen. Um, I'm, oh, we're also, we're also gonna add the uh, concealable tag to it um, because what the what would be the point of having it be a pen then <laughs> if it's not concealable? Uh, point at their face. Deck safe to look away. Yeah, don't don't look directly at it. Uh, not safe for children. Uh, under the age of three. Well, it's thirty. It's same, same thing. We're gonna keep. We're just gonna leave it the way it is. Uh, never mind. I already changed my mind. What do we have here still, though? We had um, temporary blindness or disadvantage. I'm not that cruel. <laughs> At least not right now. Um, oh, damn. Another thing is that I do have a burning desire to keep this organized, and in that regard, I've had a a lot of ship-based upgrades. And I feel like I'm going to keep all of the ship-based upgrades in the same place. So if I come up with a ship-based upgrade in my mind, I'm probably going to put it there, even though it's technically a new thing. Um, and then in this section, I also have... Uh, this is where I started introducing more gun-based things and ammo. Um, different varieties of ammo. Because my players were kind of asking, like, well, can I get a new gun? And I'm like, yes, you can. And not only that, let's actually start developing modifications for guns. Let's get some grenade launchers in here. Let's get some expanded magazines. Let's get some digital sights. Um... The digital sight is just like plus one hit, but not damage. Um, modifying range, ugh, I'm probably going to just leave that the way it is. So if I come up with any more gun-based stuff, I think it's going to go in there. Abraminix can't use it with that, I think. Keep it at 34. Yeah, uh, maybe we'll keep it at 34. Abram and uh, Nyx are... Nyx is actually the oldest player, I'm pretty sure. Um, or oldest character, with Aurelio as the youngest, though Abram is... Uh, I don't I don't really pay attention to the ages of the characters that much. I, I pay attention to who is older than who, but then after that, I, I pay no mind. Um, because to... As me, the DM, they simply all exist as fodder for my dungeons. Um, what age does that matter? Humans, unlike wine, do not age finely. I feel as though a 70-year-old man is just as blendable as a 15 year old young adventurer though saddened uh, would i be by both losses um so what else what else do we want to add earlier i put in a spy camera uh with the intention that it would lurk li uh, work like the alarm spell from dungeons and dragons th uh, 3.5 and 5e um Eh, they didn't really spring for it at the time, and I understand why. At the time, I still feel like it's a useful item, and it's way, it's way, 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 way down there. I, th I don't think it even costs that much. I think it's like, I don't know, like 70C. Um, but they didn't spring for it, and they still could. It was just like a camera that you place somewhere, and uh, they could just get a live video feed from it. It's just live streaming back to their chosen um, device. I think everybody has one now. I'm pretty sure the only person who doesn't have a device actually is Abram. But I don't think... I, I don't know if he has a phone or not. Uh, Nyx has a tablet. Aurelio bought a cell phone. 
um, we're gonna put it in a spy camera. But not just any spy camera, we're gonna put in a drone camera. And this one's gonna be a little bit more costly because I want it to be deployable. Hmm. Hmm. You know, at this point, after putting down the word drone, I'm not even thinking of like alarm spell anymore. Now I'm thinking more like a familiar. Now I'm thinking more like something that I should make more. Oh God, I hate this. I hate the software. I really wish I could have Microsoft Word back. Um, I really liked that software. I'll probably just buy it again in the future, even though I already had a license. Um, we're gonna up the price of this because this is no longer going to be a drone camera. This is gonna be a full-fledged drone. Uh, so, question about your setting. You mentioned like 50 years of straight hard tech advancement. Um, I, if you want, I could explain it, um, but some of it's like not necessarily hit a plateau technically, kind of. It's not really, um, okay, I will explain, I think I can explain it pretty easily, is that this setting has actually just come out of a dark age. But it's not a dark age in the medieval sense, it's a dark age in the future sense. Um, they've, uh... Currently, the year is 250 modern era, and it was named as such because a lot of scholars agreed that's when the wars stopped. That's when the uh, when communication and society got to a level on all these different planets where, like, tribal society and local wars and big wars kind of started to dim down, and trade started to develop more, and exploration became more to the forefront. Um, and all these people were uh, able to finally settle down and start examining what they have. So, uh, but during that time, it was a very turbulent time where technology was, um, I'm under the design choice uh, or perhaps philosophical understanding that war is, um, war is a driving factor in development of a lot of things in real life. World War II is responsible for like most of the things that we have today. Uh, in terms of technological advancement. I'm pretty sure rubber is a result of war. Rubber being, like, uh, something that you can't even escape nowadays. Uh, diesel engines to gas engines to unleaded to uh, uh, radios. Uh, all those things are something that was, uh, probably would have developed in the free sector, in the civilian setting as well. We, we know that to be fact because, like, Telegram was not developed for war, as far as I'm aware. That was developed for... Um, exploration and that's another key thing here is that uh, exploration also played a key role in this setting um because it's space but technology is uh kind of it's kind of weird where they they have um they have modern day sensibilities and modern day understanding of things but they have a lot of technology around them that's been grandfathered in uh those gundams they were they're not a new invention they're actually one of the oldest in the entire setting and they don't necessarily fully understand how they function, but they do possess the blueprints, so they are able to manufacture more, and they are able to make it, make some progress with them. It's just not quite as high. So in a way, they're in a plateau, but it's like a not quite the same plateau that maybe you're thinking of. It's not a plateau created by too much. Um, I feel like that this is a current plateau that they can overcome, and then in the future, another plateau awaits them, if that makes any sense. Um, so that So that's that. Um... I think that's the best explanation that I can give um, for now without just like waiting for the, the players to uh, get more historically involved, I suppose. So let's get, let's get a drone. I want a, I want a helicopter drone. Um, I, I wanted this to be, I was just thinking like a flying camera, like a spy camera, like a scrying spell, essentially. Um, but now I'm picturing like a full on, like a familiar like a, a wizard's owl, like something like that. I'm picturing something like the find familiar spell, where this is something that I, I'm, I'm picturing is, um, I think it would cost a gambit to activate, uh, maybe. But I think it's once it's activated, it's just going to be okay to just remain active. Like, I think that this is going to be one of those, they can just use it permanently things that I was talking about. Uh, I get you, because I was wondering how quickly tech advanced in this campaign, because, like, it seems like there's a lot of new tech and old obsolete tech coexisting. Yeah, yeah, it's a it's a big... Um, I'm also... Um, in this setting, it's a sci-fi setting. I try to play it realistically when it comes to, like... Um, like, I don't have... There are no planets that are, like, single-world biomes. Like, there is not a snow planet. Not really. There's no desert planet. There's no tropical planet. Like, it doesn't... I, I try to play things pretty realistically. Um, and so, in that regard, uh, this the society... Um, well, I guess I'll explain this. Uh, transportation is incredibly... It's the easiest thing in the universe, literally. 
because one of the things that's been grandfathered in is how to make spaceships and also orbital elevators. Uh, but not only that, some orbital elevators straight up simply already existed, but they also can build more. And that's thanks to the fact that there are solar farms that orbit the... Uh, there are five stars in this setting. There's five star systems. And they have their own set of planets. And some of them are in that Goldilocks zone, like Ayama, where it's like a, it's a perfectly nice, lush jungle environment. Um, like Usually, like, f f there's quite like a handful of planets in the Goldilocks zone already for each of these planets. Um, but then there, there are others that are just fucking harsh. Like there's, um, what was, what was the name of that other one? I don't even remember it. But they went to a, a snow planet, and that one I felt justified in having because what it really was was actually, uh, Ophir. Well, that was what it was. Ophir was a moon of a gas giant. And, uh, what it, and it, it's just, it's just basically a frozen wasteland. But it does have soil because of volcanic activity, so they could still farm. Um, and so in, in that regard, like, uh, there's lots of places to settle. Pretty much every single celestial body in, in these five-star systems. And keep in mind, that, in, that can include upwards of, like, hundreds of places? I mean, like, oh, yeah, we know the nine planets, or the eight planets, uh, if you're a trader. In our real-world solar system, okay, well, let's multiply that by five. Now we're talking maybe, like, uh, five times nine, so around 45, like, planets. Uh, maybe more. I, mean, I like to jam pack a little bit, so maybe we're talking like upwards around 60 planets, maybe? But then we also have things that are like planetoids. So we have things that are existing in the asteroid belt that are maybe a little too small to be a real planet. Um, but they can still facilitate a habitat. And so we have people living there. We got space stations, we got moons. Um, and then on each of these different places, uh, 45 campaigns. And yeah, it's a lot of settings. It's a lot of different settings. Um, and then on top of that, we also have uh, grandfathered in solar farms, uh, which harvest something that they simply know as sunshine. They do not know exactly what this fuel is. I know what this fuel is because I'm the DM. Um, and that is basically free energy because these solar farms have been grandfathered in. Uh, they are old, older than anybody. They simply exist, and they are automatic facilities, factories that have just been... At some point in the past, obviously, these factories were built to create fuel, um, but since whoever has built those, a lot of shit has happened, and they no longer know how to manufacture these plants, these facilities, but the plants are still going. They're automated, and they just produce sunshine. They just produce fuel, and this fuel can be used in the engines of all these different spaceships, and so fuel for space travel is not hurting. So ironically, while they live, so well, not really ironically. That's the point: is that they they have modern sensibilities and a modern understanding of technology, maybe like even 1970s understanding of technology. But because there are these facilities out there that simply give them the fuel that they would need to create these different uh, engines for space travel, space travel is very easy. Space travel is actually one of the easiest things to do in this setting. Some people would find that it's cheaper to move off world than down the road. Um, just because it's fuels almost it's it's pennies it's it's so prevalent and so um, it's very well regulated I would like to specify but that's not something the players are ever going to be interested in um, but sunshine's like basically it's pennies it's gasoline uh, go go have some um, and uh, it's it's great um, and then on top of that for because uh, it is five star systems and no fuel can get you from one place to another that quickly it would take years. And so in that regard, there are the gateways, which are these gigantic circular rings that exist out around celestial bodies and Lagrange points or just orbiting different other large bodies. They, they don't actually orbit anything very often. But um, you fly by those, and you simply broadcast a radio signal. And depending on the radio signal that you broadcast to them, those gateways will send you into what's called the dark space or the in-between. It's got a lot of names depending on what culture you're from. Um, and you spend time traveling in the dark space and you come out the other side it's a very quick process maybe uh, not too quick it still takes per upwards of per maybe a few weeks maybe even a few months to travel to the farthest reaches of the universe um, farthest corners of the five sectors the five star systems uh, but you can get where you want to go and well just you know be careful because people who've tried to navigate the dark space instead of simply letting the ship's momentum take it where it may people who've tried to decelerate mid transport have not been heard from ever again and people who've made even minute adjustments while they're in the dark space simply nudging the thruster a little bit to the left or right find that when they come out the other side they're like hundreds of kilometers away from their intended destination um, and then they have to spend like another two weeks getting 
to where they want to be in in real space. So the, that those are the two facilitators for space travel in the setting, and why it's so easy is the these this, these two technologies, the solar farms. Dark space fixes the time dilation of FTL travel too. Yes, it does. Also, uh, it's not really like this isn't really like a galaxy wide setting. It's really only the five star systems, and they're already kind of close to begin with. So even if the if the maybe on extreme cases of like galaxy end to galaxy end, the FTL issues would not be alleviated. Um, but for the sake of what's happening in this this small corner of the universe, it's not like a galaxy wide span. There are no aliens. It's all humans. There's been some genetic modification taking place, so there's a, a wide variety of humans. Um, but they don't. Uh, it's not a big. It's not a big wide gaping setting in terms of sci-fi uh, for how sci-fi goes. I, it's it's huge. Like it's, it spans multiple planets. Um, there's lots of crazy cultures and empires have risen and fallen uh, in different sectors. Um, and there's like hundreds of years of history, but yes, that is uh, this dark space. Uh, I don't, it's like subspace. You can really call it anything you want because that's the whole point is that all these different cultures and empires and societies have known these rings all of their existence and uh, their the way that they function is pretty mundane. Radio's, radio was developed in like the late 1800s. In our in our real world, so I feel like that that's not a uh, that's not a hard hurdle. It's basically like if you can get into space, which you can, because there's a bunch of blueprints laying around for how to build spaceships and a lot of leftover materials and a lot of facilities that simply make the stuff for you. If you can get into space, which is easy again because there's there's orbital elevators and it's like a few hours to get to the top. Don't get me wrong, but you get in the elevator, you get your ship in there, you load it in with a forklift, you get up there. You're already in space. It's easy to launch. You don't need a shuttle. You don't need huge amounts of fuels to break gravity because the, the, the space elevator does it for you. So you're in space, and then you just need fuel. And you don't even need a lot of fuel. You could probably get by with regular jet fuel because, like you said, you don't need to get that far because you don't need to break gravity. Um, but we have sunshine. Sunshine's great. That's a powerful fuel anyway. You can get back across the, six, this, uh, the five systems like three times before you have to refuel. Um, but then once you get near one of these gateways, all you have to do is have the ability to use a radio. And I feel like that's a pretty easy prerequisite. So these settings, uh, we got some Mad Maxian-esque people who are still able to use space travel because it's just not a hard, it's just not a hard hurdle. Uh, it's, just, it's just pretty easy. So you can have some pretty low, um, low tech, low society standards um, in this setting that are still fully capable of doing uh, space travel. That being said, though, the majority is modern day stuff. Uh, but let's get this fucking quadcopter. The entire time I've been talking, I've also been trying to think in the background of what this thing can and cannot do. I think it's got some kind of manipulators on it. It's got some kind of rudimentary hands. Uh, a familiar in Dungeons & Dragons can do a lot of things. It can basically take every action that a player can, except for... Well, I was going to say except for attack, but it can actually attack as well. It's just not a very satisfying attack. It's like, what, 1d6? Um, no modifiers. And its HP is like 10 if it's an imp. Um... But they always have weird stuff, like they're resistant to like fire or something, or they, they boost your magic defenses. So we can we can come up with all kinds of crazy stuff. Maybe there's different kinds of quadcopter drones. Oh my god! Oh my god, we've opened up a whole new can of worms here. We can have a Type A that's got resistant to bolts or, or resistant to fire. Maybe what kind of drone you have, you can like you can take some of its resistances for your own. So now if you've got a bolt-resistant drone, you're bolt-resistant. Uh, would this drone have an AI installed? AI is banned in this setting, actually. It also doesn't really exist um, because they haven't gotten to the point where they can fully develop a artificial intelligence. But there are some things that come very, very close um, and in that regard, a ban, a, a legal law has been instituted saying that we haven't, we haven't made AI yet, but if you could, it's illegal. It's banned. Um, and that's a very old ancient law, actually. I say ancient. Like I said, this setting's really only 215 years old, really, because before that, I don't want to say that the year zero modern era was like barbarous lawlessness. Like there was like, plenty of hundreds of years that existed before the year zero modern era that were perfectly fine societal years and people remember it fondly um i would think that ai and chases would affect physical and mental status yeah yeah there's just no ai just because um then i feel like i really would be getting into the realm of like well if ai exists and space travel exists like what are we still what are we still doing here with our mental uh, mental facilities of 
1970s folk, and uh, it starts to answer, there's a lot of philosophical questions that come along with AI um, that I'm not uh, scared by, and I've already introduced some stuff into the campaign, but uh, okay, that's actually, I can actually talk about it now, because uh, there was no AI in this setting, because there is a character in this setting already that is an AI, um, that their development has been directly linked to the player's actions. It's been related to their... They, that character wouldn't exist if it weren't for the player's actions. Um, this character that they've affectionately named K uh, was originally just like a servant droid. Like, their name was K-1-7, and their AI is uh, of the level of... Um, it could talk. It, it could talk to you. It could say hello. It could perform complex tasks, but the, the definition, the, the line was, but it can't learn. It can't be taught. It, it, it won't think for itself. It won't learn... Um, its rules are purely dictated by what you've installed on it. It's not self-aware. It's self... It, it's aware of itself in the sense of it knows it takes up space, and it knows it needs, it, it needs to maintain itself, but even that, is, it can't maintain itself. Um, but through the direct action of the players, this, this former servant robot has actually developed a basic understanding of of intelligence it's become slightly sentient um so there is ai but i want it to be special i want i i think that artificial intelligence is something that's very um cool and i would love to explore it more and that's why i don't really want the drone that's like a an a it's not a person like it's just kind of like a, i want it to be like a like a pet um like a dog it can have like an artificial intelligence in the sense that like it's aware of itself and it treats itself right it's going to avoid dangers uh it can path plan it can return to sender it can send messages maybe it can talk in the sense of like it can just relay information um it'll probably have some kind of voice feature simply because that's easy for the dm to use i don't want to have to type up information that the drone requires and send it to players individually that takes time so if the drone could talk then that, that would just be a way that I could usefully relay information. But I don't want to give it artificial intelligence because I feel like that weakens Kay's character and any other instances that we might have of artificial intelligence showing up in this campaign. Um, the, the are we human question is uh, one that I'm, I'm excited at the prospect of possibly exploring. Uh, and we already have some of that because Abram is uh, like... His um, birth was not the usual not the norm and he's already on a path of um kind of like questioning what does it mean to be human but he's from the angle of nature versus nurture um whereas k is the case of well i'm not made out of flesh and bits truly ancient tech i can't believe you're weaponizing the robo pet toys yeah this is gonna be like that fucking the flipsy doll whatever or furby a small furby like device That's how we're going to begin that description. Um, hmm. All right, let's get into the nitty-gritty. Uh, let's get into this. I want, to, I want to get this drone done out of the way. We can make a bunch of devices and different types after we make one. So we're going to have one here, and we're going to have a, uh, a foldable robot. I'm picturing something that folds up to, like, backpack-sized or maybe, like, hangs from the hip, um, probably about the size of, like, a textbook at the smallest. I don't want it to be concealable. It's not, it's not going to have the concealable tag. Um, oh my god, if it's a Furby, you have to give it incredible durability. If I'm gonna make a... I will probably make a Furby drone, and it's gonna be like... It can't fly, but it's indestructible. Um, and if you look at it for too long, you have to roll for stability. A foldable... Uh, well, not really... A, not a robot. A foldable... Flying... Uh, a fl I'm gonna say a foldable drone with a fly speed of... Because that's an actual thing. Uh, f speeds. Um, so we're gonna give it a speed of 20 because we don't want we don't really want it to be too well. It can be 25. I want it to be a useful fly speed, but I don't want it to be able to catch up with fleeing NPCs. <laughs> uh, behind the scenes stuff right there. I mean, this is the D and D design stream. If if anybody wanted to come in here and pretend like this is, doesn't have some kind of behind the scenes de design element to it, that'd be that'd be foolish. I'm not gonna fool myself like that. A foldable drone with fly speed of 25, so it can't catch up with enemies. Um, that can rudimentarily interact with the world at large using, uh, we want to give it some kind of, um, 
uh, using an arm. It's going to have some kind of like deployable claw arm. It probably should be able to plug into devices uh, because devices are a huge thing in this setting. Um, I've been trying to, to reiterate that this is a setting that's not too technologically advanced, but like it is a computer. It's an information age society that this place is living in. Um, except for certain places where it's simply just not right. Like Sargasso, which is the original name of the campaign and the first planet that these the people started on, is like a trash planet. Um, it was just underdeveloped. It's one of the most recently discovered planets. It, uh, it was discovered the year, like, zero modern era. That's actually uh, why they decided to retroactively call it the modern era is because, hey, we discovered this a very large planet that already has people on it, and we seem to be developing a multi-star society, and so we should rename this to the modern era. We're living in the modern times, as some scholars would would say, not aware that every time is the modern time, if that's the time that you're from. A uh, foldable drone with a fly speed of 25 feet that can rudimentarily interact with the world at large. Using a... I'm going to give it a single... Uh, I don't think it... Uh, do I need to describe that it has a claw arm? I'm probably using a single claw arm. Um, and this is more detail oriented, but it should be able to, I like the Warlock's Pact of the Chain feature, which is a, uh, is this the, this is, everything is focused around using a familiar, um, and the familiar can cast spells th that the owner of the familiar is casting. So it's like, uh, you can, you can channel your spell through, through the drone. Um, through the familiar. So if you want, if you needed to reach a computer that was too far away, uh, if only you could fly up there, um, you can have the drone fly and then cast your spell as your action. But it takes up your action. It doesn't give you extra actions. It, just, it takes up your action. Um, it does make it so you can basically exist in two places at once, though. But now we're, now we're getting into the question of what else can the drone do? Because this is a modern setting. I know the Pact of the Chain feature makes it so. By claw arms, is it like a crab claw or is it like a hooked claw? Uh, I'm going to leave that to the discretion of the players. I would like a hooked claw because I think that that's horrifying. I would I'd love to see a quadcopter drone that flies at you with a large hand hook car hook door. But I'll leave that up to the players. Some stuff I just like... I feel like they hate me whenever I say, like, I don't know, it's whatever you want, because they're expecting me to come up with all the details, and maybe I should, and maybe I will come up with more details for them, because they like to believe in this real world that really exists, which really does. Um, I try to give them some control over how things aesthetically look sometimes, because sometimes it just doesn't matter. I'd prefer that they make it look how it looks, how it would look good in their eyes. in their. I want them to design in their image. Um, but sometimes they like it to just be like a a well-thought-out, pre-planned thing. So we're going to have a single crab claw arm. Should it be able to deliver gambits? That is the question. What can it do if... Um, as an action, a player with a computer device can look through the drone's eyes. That is something that I think is already powerful. Being able to simply have eyes in a location that you cannot be in, I think, is already powerful. So should it be able... I'm going to put it to vote. I wish... How many people do we have in the chat? We have two people. I'm a third person. We can tie break. That's three people. Um, my vote would be, can... It, uh, should the drone be able to cast gambits? Should the drone have dark vision slash night vision? I think that it doesn't matter because all the players already have dark vision slash night vision. One of them actually has night vision, the other one has heat vision. Um, yeah, I'll give it I'll give it dark vision, but I'm gonna give it like a lesser version of dark vision because I don't want them to rely on the drone too much. I want the drone to be like a test to test the waters kind of thing. I don't I don't want them to be trying to like navigate entire dungeons with, <laughs> with the drone. Um, infrared, okay, I got the whole spectrum. Yeah, they got the whole fucking spectrum. It's really annoying, actually, because every single time they enter anywhere, they're like, what do I see? And I'm like, well, you see a... And they're like, no, what do I see? And I'm like, I guess everything. 
<laughs> you see the rogue hiding in the corner. You see the lemur hiding on the rooftops. You see that it's slightly dimmed light up to 30 feet. But then beyond that, there's three flickering candles in the shape of a cross. Like, they, the nothing can hide from their eyes. And so I'm trying to figure out some way to hide something from their eyeballs. Um, um, it has dark vision up to, uh, let's say, 15 feet. I think regular dark vision from Dungeons & Dragons is like... 30 feet you see fine and then 30 feet after that is dim light so you can see a maximum of 60 feet but half of it's dim um so this is half of that it's half of half is what we're doing here the, the, i don't think the familiars should be better at seeing than they are because i also want to be able to put some other equipment in there that is good oh fuck you know and then abram bought heat vision goggles on top of this or or some kind of night vision goggles so now literally every single player in the party has some form of seeing in the dark and I foolishly just let the one player have heat vision. Um, but I said it can't see through walls, at least not truly. Like, you can't just have x-ray vision, but you can have heat vision. Um, and that's basically functioned as dark vision. <laughs> Drone can do EVPs? Drone can't do EVPs. Uh, cannot reveal the... E <sighs> cannot reveal the... Hmm. Well, electro... Sensing electronic sources is not something that would be disuseful. Do I want the drone to be able to do that, though? <laughs> mm, no one can see it without true sight. There has been a few cases of things like true sight where there's been, like, unseeable stuff, but it's, both, it's mostly been electronic fields or magnetic fields or, or both interacting in tandem since they're the same thing, just with different verbs. Um, I think what I'm going to end up doing is I'm going to actually have the quadcopter function as a computer. I'm going to give it the computer tag because gambits in this game, um, they'll require a material, but it's a consistent material, and there's like only five of them. So it's like you need a computer to cast splicing gambits. You need me you need security tools to cast uh, other engineer uh, gambits. You need explosives to cast these type, like explosive gambits um you need chemicals to cast these science gambits and i think it's just those oh and then five uh no there's six because there's also survival tools and then there's also medical tools so like with those six tools you can cast all the gambits um and so to that end i'm going to label the quadcopter drone a computer because earlier in my store i put up for sale computer upgrades and some of them were just stuff that I intended for the players to attach to their phones or to their tablets. And they are things like uh, EVPs or um, uh, spectrometers of various forms and shapes. Uh, that one that... Uh, I used to know the name of it, but I forgot it now. The one that registers radiation. Uh, Geiger counter. Uh, Geiger counter is one of the things. I think that one of the players even bought it. So if I put the drone and label it as a computer... Um, I like it also now because it's it can become a very personal thing. I'm gonna sell you the bare bones drone, and I'm gonna I'm gonna knock the price down. I'm gonna knock the price down to about two hundred dollars. And my intention now here is that this is the bare bones drone, and it can do whatever you have paid to upgrade it with. So it can have an EVP sensor if they buy it and put it on, or they build one. I know Nix is able to. I think she has a skill that's straight up. I can build things if I have enough time and money. So she can up, she, she can upgrade this drone if she wants to. Maybe Abram can have one that has like a gun on it. I'm okay with that. I, I think I'm gonna say that it can only shoot as a bonus action, or it can shoot as a regular action. I'll probably say shoot as a bonus action because this is already such a small party, and I wanna. Uh, when I started the campaign, I was like, really, this is my first campaign, and so I wanted to keep it small. Um, so there's only the three of them, uh, which is fine, but I think it's okay to make them a little bit overpowered then because there's only the three of them um let's see here uh the drone can do evps reveal the ethereal plane no one can see the true sight i think if the drone senses it it might be like it's it senses it by malfunctioning it just <laughs> the drone flies into the corridor about 25 feet it begins to descend about a foot it maintains its elevation for another second or two and then the copter completely fritzes out it sparks once and falls dead to the floor <laughs> <laughs> players um, make of that what you will. Can you leave to CBS? Uh -huh. I am, in fact, typing an IM to a person of interest to me, so don't mind that. Um, so what can this what can this bare-bones drone do from the get-go? It can fly. That's already pretty cool. You can see through it as an action. 
Um, I'm not going to put a limiter on that because they already spent so much money that I don't think they're going to want to distance themselves from it for very long. Earlier in the campaign, I had to put limits on how long, how far stuff could reach, like cameras or uh, radios, because that was a legitimate concern. I wasn't sure if they were going to space themselves out a huge distance because there's a modern setting. I mean, there's cars, cars, trains, planes, automobiles. Um, so distance is a factor that can be overcome pretty easy, depending on the seller. Um, I, uh, I don't think that this is going to be like a junk bot. There might be different versions. I think this is going to be the Lunaris model, which is to say white, sleek, ready for upgrades. Um, maybe we'll have a scrapyard variant that like comes with a, <laughs> comes with a cap gun pre-installed and it shoots off a flare that can blind enemies. Uh, it could have some form of defense, like a little shooty on it. I don't want to. I don't want to put a little shooty on it immediately. I want them to be able to put a little shooty on it if they want to. Tell you what, we'll make that an upgrade package. How about that? Fifty dollar, fifty dollar shooty bit. Um, <clears throat> and the, we want to make it small. I, I really don't want it to be doing a lot of damage, so we're going to keep it at a one d four. A one d four is um, concealable in this setting. If it does one d four damage, it's automatically concealable. Uh, which means that I, I I don't even think that I I think if it's concealable you don't even have to roll to hide it I think you just do um, whereas other stuff if you tried to hide it you'd have to roll stealth I think if it's like a 1d4 knife or a 1d4 pocket pistol I think the player just hides it and they don't even have to do it so I'm going to leave this at 1d4 um, we'll have a little shooty bit what, what are we going to have here uh, Lunaris tries to keep to a pretty standard system um, I, have a, I have a feeling that this is probably not the first drone that Lunaris has built. They're actually pretty well known for their robotics. Not, not their AI. Their AI is not amazing, but their robotics are pretty extravagant. So this is probably not the first robot they've designed. So this is probably like a later iteration. So it's probably Model 4. Um, and it's probably not just a gun, right? It's probably like a whole damn... It's probably a whole damn system. It's probably a whole rig. And so it's going to be a 1D4... Calibre, and I'm going to spell that in the truly snooty fashion because it's Lunaris, and that's just what they do. Um, uh, pistol, Capita. What is uh, I need? I need to brush up on my gun terminology. Um. Chamber, that's it. Chamber. 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 Um, and barrel. Four. Attachment. Two. Compatible drones. I think I'm gonna stick with drone. I've been I've been trying to figure out what to call robots in this campaign because like, I guess robot gets the job done. Uh, I don't want to call it droids because that's really just a Star Wars thing. Um, I don't want to call them androids because android has its roots in the Greek word for for man, for human. Um, so, it, so a lot of these robots aren't really androids because they're not human like. Uh, I am imagining the Furby drone with that gun now. The Nars fiercest foe has its hidden in the, uh, has this hidden in their hideout. Here at Yon, as you pass by, you turn, you see glowing yellow eyes and suddenly a D4 damage. The gun barrel slides out of its fucking beak, blows your fingers right off. Terrifying. Uh, 1D4 pistol caliber chamber and barrel for attachment to compatible drones. Ooh. Ugh. Uh, I don't I don't know if I feel comfortable giving them the ability to fire it as a bonus action yet. What level are they? Seven? What can you do at level seven? Level seven, you got some pretty damn good bonus actions. What can you do? By by level seven, you could have been able to take the dual weapon feat and two hand like any weapon in the game, as long as it doesn't have the heavy modifier, or even if it does have the heavy modifier, we'll just assume that that means that someone's rocking like two long swords which means that they attack with one longsword, which does 1d8 damage, because they've got a one-handed, which is an average of 4.5 damage, and then they can attack with their bonus action with another longsword, which is another 4.5 damage for a total of 9 damage in one, one round. So if someone's shooting a 1d6 pistol, and this, that's, what, 3.5? Plus another 2.5? which is like 7. So I guess being able to shoot a 1d4 pistol as a bonus action isn't really that big a deal. Um, Two-weapon fighting is any weapon without heavy. Okay, that's important. That's important. 
<laughs> dual wielding spear build. And now you're now you're thinking with now you're thinking with things. Um, it's ridiculous and it can work. And you are totally and one hundred percent correct. I feel like uh, an underappreciated fighting style. Um, that was actually a legitimate uh, fighting style that Ryze was going to use in Dark Souls 3 because the fucking Drang Twin Spears are fucking awesome and cool, and I feel like dual spears are wildly underappreciated aesthetic. Um, but I'm doing a playthrough, and I, I, I do my best ideas when I'm doing playthroughs. Um, where are we? Where do I leave off? Uh, M4 Defense Rig. Uh, 1d4 pistol. Yeah, we'll let it be fireball as a bonus action. Hmm. It's also a 1d4, so it technically is concealable, which means it's hidden on the drone. It only does 1d4, so they can't, like, fly it up to the top of the skyscraper and have it, like, assassinate somebody because they're not going to kill somebody in 1d4 shots. Uh, I remember there was a guy in Sangaku Basara, I think, who uses dual spears, too. I forget if that's one of the guy's name. He's red, though. I think I know what you're talking about. I don't really... My weeb phase, I, I just didn't really go through one in middle school or high school, really. Like, now, currently, in the present time, is the most I've ever known about anime, so I, I really missed out on a lot, but I think I know what you're talking about. Yeah, there's a lot of instances of dual spear fighting in various media. It's just some of it's, like... Most of it's anime, <laughs> which is which is fine. I know Lancer from Fate is, like, the most obvious example, but I've seen it before. I've, I've seen it on lots of different characters, to be honest. It seems like the... Um, Dual spears is sort of like the uh, the the loner swordsman kind of like cousin, <laughs> which is it's fun. It's fun. There's a lot of fun things out there that I feel like need more attention. Um, one d four pocket pistol, which is why I'm trying to do my fucking part. I'll see you in Dark Souls three fucking AU, buddy. Uh, can be fired as a bonus action. Yeah, I'll just leave that be. Why not? I, I feel like I need to err on the side of uh, overpowering the players instead of underpowering the players. Also, it's $50, so like, let's live. Let's live a little. And let's also specify that that is for a drone. I'm trying to keep drone in all of this, all, anything that I put that I intend for the drone so that they know it's for the drone, like immediately at a moment's, at a moment's notice. Readability is also kind of important here because I'm just going to, I'm just going to PDF this and I'm going to send it out. I want to see my pretty boy. Who's your pretty boy? Yes! Oberon. Oh, buddy. Oh, buddy, old oh, man, old oh, man. He still exists and he is fighting his way up the fucking ladder. He had the player's characters uh, attempt to assassinate his immediate higher up in the mafia food chain in like episode like six. Um, they didn't kill a guy, but they did like incriminate him enough to send him to prison for life. And so Obron was like, oh, that sounds good. Oh, you meant me. Oh, you're so sweet. Um, I don't know how long you've been here, but we're making some items for my D&D campaign and all of them are reusable for regular D&D, which is fantastic. And right now we're thinking about familiar quadcopters. Quadcopters that function as familiars, like how wizards have owls that do shit for them. I'm thinking of a quadcopter that does that in this setting because it's sci-fi. Um, so right now we've got a foldable drone. So it's storable. It's got a fly speed of 25 feet. So it, it, it can move pretty fast, but not faster than person running. Um, it functions as a computer, so it can be used to cast gambits by people who, who use gambits that are intelligence-based, essentially. Um, they can look through it. It's got a spy camera on it. It's got dark vision up to 15 feet, so it can see in the dark. What else can it do, though? If they spend an extra $50, it can shoot somebody in the foot with a pocket pistol. Uh... You know what? New plan. This is 1d4 of bolts damage. Because A, that's cool. Uh, what's the max range the drone can be from the owner? I don't really know, and I almost feel like I don't want to specify that, because I'll have a feeling that I'll accidentally limit myself or my players. I feel like if I... I feel like the only thing that I would 
possibly think of in terms of range would be to limit them from doing I, I can't see I'm trying to think of like well what's the most extreme case and I guess the most extreme case is like planet to planet but it's not like they can really do anything the drone can't really function on its own and like well, okay so what would they use it for they'd use the drone to talk to somebody right well I mean you can do that anyway this is a setting where you can talk to people like with like video calls and stuff like that though if you're talking to somebody in another system that would normally require the use of gateway transportation, which is to say FTL, you can't talk to them. You can only send emails. You can only send text messages. You can send video messages, but you can only send emails, essentially. You, you can't have a live conversation through the gateways. Uh, it's impossible. Uh, it would be ridiculous. Like, maybe some, you can have incredibly laggy conversations, uh, but it would be, like, hours, potentially, before you got a call back. So it's like, you can text message, you can send emails through the gateways. Um, and I feel like that's the limit on the quadcopter anyway. It's like, you, you can't use it, like, I don't know. Because I don't want to put feet on... I, I do want the players to say, hey, there's a really creepy abandoned ship out in the wastes, and we should wait outside and let the drone explore a little bit inside. And I, I want them to be able to do that. But then I, I don't want to limit myself by saying the drone only works within 250 feet. And that means that I can only make abandoned ships that are no bigger than 250 feet if I want them to be explorable with the drone. Um, flying up sky... What's, that, what's the max range the drone can be from the owner? Flying up a skyscraper can still go out of range, possibly, if it's not caught somehow. Yeah, I should probably put some kind of footage on it, but then the players will also... Another thing is that any numbers I give the players, they can also hold against me. So if I say, like, if I make, a, like, a skyscraper that's, like, I don't want them to be able to use the drone to fly up all the way to the top, but I've already accidentally said it's 300 feet tall, and they're like, but that's within the 500 feet distance of the drone, then, like, then I'm caught. And so I don't want to, if I put down a footage of how far I can go, I end up basically just limiting myself on, I need to, I've given myself another rule when designing and I don't even know if they're going to buy it. That's another thing. Is like they, they might not buy this. If this was a class skill that I know that one of them is going to get a drone as a familiar, because that's just how the class works, then I, then I can expect it. Then I can plan around it. But like, I don't even know if they're going to buy this. Uh, um, I, might, I don't know. I might just play it by ear. I might just tell them, like, listen, it's got real good fucking footage. Um, what's the biggest ship in the setting? The biggest ship in the setting is like a few miles big. Range won't limit your dun uh, a range won't limit your dungeons. All it means is like they explore the areas within the range with the drone, and then they send the drone deeper as they enter. Yeah, it's like they're, so they're just gonna make it bigger anyway. So I guess I could just put a limit on it. What's how big is a football field? That's a hundred. It's a hundred yards. But I mean like the actual stadium. I don't mean just like the field. Because I feel like that's a good size estimate when it comes to me trying to visualize things. Not that I'm a football fan, but I just I've been around a lot of stadiums in my time. Because I feel like a football stadium is an adequate size for also a hangar. A large structure that is meant for containing ships. Um, I know orbital elevators are like several miles wide at their base. Should we fall on real world? Should we just simply look up what is the longest range a quadcopter drone can, uh, can work on? Ooh, okay, so the DJI Inspire 1 Pro Quadcopter cost $3,000, which is uh, roughly about, uh, like, yeah, about 200 credits in our setting. Uh, the the Sargassum credit goes a long way in, in the economy. Um, so it attracts mainly experienced drone flyers. Uh, easy to learn. Uh, and it goes for around 2 kilometers flight range in ideal conditions. That's pretty fucking big. Um, that sounds good to me. That sounds fine. I'm going to go with it. I'm, I mean, this is a military thing, right? Like, this is a fucking up-to-spec drone. It costs a lot of money. We want to give it some good fucking range. So it has a flight range of two kilometers. And the best part is, is that that's in uh, non-imperial units that my players do not know. <laughs> so I'll see them in hell. Um, 
And if there's ever anything that I really wanted them to stay out of, like uh, like a skyscraper, that's like, you know, I don't want you to see what's at the top, then it's like, I, there's there's ways. There's magnetic fields that will stop your drone from flying that high. There are cameras that are going to catch it as it flies up, because it's not small, it's not fast, and it's not quiet. Oh, that's another thing. So this is like a drone. So I imagine it's not super loud, necessarily, but it's not quiet. It's not stealthy. I don't think that this thing's going to be a stealth-based thing. This is more of a exploration and combat-based thing to me so far. But maybe one of the upgrades will be silent running. And I feel like a silent running drone is something that is going to be a lot more expensive than just like the bullet would be. And I feel like the ability to... 1d4 is a bonus action. Like, that's just free extra damage. I think that that should probably cost a significant amount of money, but still be obtainable. Um, so we're, we're going to set that at 100. Also, it's not a consumable. Remember, I feel like consumable items should be under 100 and consumable items that are one-time use, just 100 at, at the most. Um, the Air Force flies alongside your drone, threatens to shoot it down if it doesn't land. Uh, if you got two kilometers into the air. Yeah, two kilometers directly straight up is fucking high, but that also is under ideal conditions, um, which I think that I myself will specify in here. Because uh, not, I'm not trying to do this as like a, a DM's wiggle room, like a way to wiggle out of this, but I do want to uh, have a... a, a um, I try to play the game in a realistic manner. If a player can convince me that something could realistically happen, I'll, I'll usually err on their, on their side. Um, and likewise, when I say something is unrealistic for them to accomplish, I, I expect them to, to believe me um, and accept that. So if I say, like, I'm sorry, but it's a sandstorm, you cannot fly the drone up to two kilometers. In fact, you can't even fly it outside of five feet without it flying into some gust of wind and shooting off into the air. I think that they'll accept that, and I think that that is acceptable. Uh, heavily reduce the range of silent. Yeah, yeah, I think you're right because that could end up being fucking nuts. Because I have a feeling that suddenly this thing is now like a uh, like a fucking reaper, <laughs> UAV like hovering somewhere over in in the deserts. Uh, what a horrifying thought. Heavily reduce the range of silent. Yeah, because then it's also not necessarily even a case of this is an upgrade. Now it's a now it's like a choice. Um, but how much should it cost? Um, I would like to say that 500 hertz. Uh, something that costs 500 in this setting like, is, is a painful thing. I try to make it so that um, the players are consistently always getting around $1,000 each. Um, maybe more? I, I don't even remember what the last amount of money I gave them was, but I think it was upwards around 6000 So that gave them 2000 to spend each. And keyword on each, because I don't really want them to... I want them to pool their money only if they want to. I'm not going to expect it from them, and I don't feel like they should be expected to do so either. Um, so when I say something costs 500 that's a quarter of their buying power for potentially an entire arc. And uh, being, like, like up, upwards? Like, 10 sessions. Like, you are not going to be able to... You're not getting paid again for 10 sessions. So something that costs 500 credits is a quarter of your buying power for 10 sessions. Uh, Lunaris could use whole squads of silent runners. Imagine that, Terra. Well, they already do, and that's kind of why I'm excited to put in the drones, is because there's a lot of stuff that exists in the campaign setting that has been used against the players that I would like the players to be able to use back. And Lunaris is already famous for its uh, robotics, its drones. Um, they had a straight-up centaur robot that was able to fight as a boss, like a mini-boss, essentially. Um, so the silent running drone is gonna have it's gonna have some kind of nasty nasty bits on it. Uh, we're gonna go for we're gonna go, we're gonna go for 450 for now, um, and we're gonna say that this is a this is I think it's gonna change the way the drone functions entirely. I don't think that this drone is it's, it's gonna change the drone because the only way it's gonna be running silent I feel is if it has wings instead of rotors. It's gonna be more like an airfoil design rather than like a quadcopter. And so already we've changed the way this thing works. I don't think that this thing is going to be trying to um, do any kinds of crazy maneuvers. I don't think it's going to be able to pull off the kind of intricate things that the quadcopter is supposed to be able to do. The quadcopter's got a claw arm. That thing's supposed to be able to interact with the environment. My, my idea is that the quadcopter is essentially the equivalent to Mage Hand with the expectation that the quadcopter can get damaged and can be rendered inert. 
Speaking of which, we need to give the quadcopter drone some HP. Um, familiars in Dungeons and Dragons have only around like 10 HP on average, but then they usually have like a resistance to some kind of damage. Um, and I, f we're not playing. We're we're playing Dungeons and Dragons. We're not playing some kind of unknown system. So I think if we're gonna do, I'm just gonna I'm gonna trust the boys down at Wizards of the Coast, um, and say that this has 10 hit points. However, I'm not going to break their super mega amazing cool toy, at least not yet. So I'm going to say that if it gets down to zero HP, zero, zero hit points, um, it just needs to be repaired. And while I think that the repair function is should be something of a specialty, where they have to bring it to someone and pay to get it repaired, uh, we kind of... I feel like that would be ignoring my party composition. Uh, one of the people in my party, two of them actually, are are grease monkeys. I got one who's like a down and dirty sal salvage Mad Maxian esque um, junk rabbit, uh, and then meanwhile I've got Nyx, who's like a, a cyberpunk techno fiend. So I feel like both of them should have the uh, ability to fix a drone, and so we're gonna give them the ability to fix a drone. Um, but I think it's only gonna be able to be fixed over a short rest. And I think it's going to require a dice roll of some kind. Um, and we're also going to give this its own. Once again, I like to have the bottom line. And so I think I'll make the bottom line, in this case, stating its hit points and how to fix it, because I think that's important. Because I don't want them to buy it, pic picturing that it's either A, a one-time use thing, which would be stupid, or B, it's broken and it's gone forever. It can be repaired over a short rest. With a successful DC. What's a good DC? Short rests can happen pretty often in a day. They can actually literally happen 24 times potentially in a day if the players are stupid. But um, so potentially. There's no healer in this party, so if they want to recover HP, they usually have to sit down and take a fucking short rest and spend some hit die, which is fine. They've been doing it pretty consistently. They usually take, like, maybe two rests in a day, so that's two chances um, to repair a drone, and one of them is pretty good with their intelligence and their wisdom, so I'm going to make it a 15. I'm going to do DC 15. I feel like that's, like... Um, my my understanding here is that a DC 10 means that the average person who has no particular skill in this has a 50% chance of success in whatever thing that we're describing. A DC 10 is you have a 50-50 shot. Um, so a DC 15 means that the average Joe is unlikely to complete this task. Mr. Mr. Freeman, who works down at the grocery store um, and moonlights as a uh, video game aficionado, should not have a 50-50 chance of repairing a drone that has received bullet damage. But I do want it to not be too impossible because I think that... Well, I, for, I just don't want it to be impossible. Um, and we're going to make this a intelligence. I'll shorthand it because we're already using too many words. Int or whiz. I could also say that they can use um, they could also use a gambit because I know that Nyx has gambits that are specifically designed for just simply fixing things. Um, and you know what? That's okay. That's totally fine. I, I want them to have the ability to use their gambits for things that are useful and interesting and make sense for the character. Um, so this is just one more way that someone's characterization could potentially reveal itself. Um, and we also upped the cost because I feel like that it, this is only going to be a one-time purchase. So if it is just a one-time purchase, it should be a little bit more expensive. I want I want to hurt a little bit. This is one eighth of their paycheck, um, which still leaves them with plenty of room for ammunition. Um, and they also tend to pool about half their resources to buy ship upgrades and stuff like that. And there's still a bunch of ship upgrades that they haven't gotten yet, so they're, they're still probably gonna want to get some of those. I think uh, Abram has been eyeing some more guns. Um, there's a spacesuit there that there's there's some stuff that I want them to have, and that's also another reason why some stuff is so cheap compared to things that are more expensive. Is like I I just want them to have it. I want to be able to create encounters and designs that are based around them 
having some of these things. Um, so I do want them to have some of the stuff. Let's add some flavor, though. Let's add some flavor to this drone, because it's, it's boring if it's just a bunch of numbers. A foldable drone with a fly speed of 25 feet that can rudiments your area of the world at large using a... Well, it doesn't need to say at large. Using a single call like arm. And this is key. This is very important. I can interact with the world using a single claw, uh, clab claw, uh, crab claw, crab claw arm, and an emotive LED face. That's incredibly important because now it gives the players the potential to give this little robot some facial features some LEDs, some lights, some way that it can express itself. Um, and it also means that I can convey information through the drone in a more believable way. I can't, I, I'm not just going to say, like, the drone looks at you and says in its baritone voice, uh, up ahead are three mooks, and four of them are sitting next to explosive barrels. Um, no, 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 I'm going to say that the, uh, the LED is going to be the way that this thing communicates. It's going to communicate through its LED face. Um... But speaking of communication, oh, 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 oh speaking of communication, um, not a drone spear, as exciting as that would be, I want a speaker, um, I want there to be an ability to speak through the drone. But I also want it to be an upgrade. Silent running drone. The drone can fly silently, though its range is halved. Hmm. This is still good, but I do like them to... I, I still want them to feel like they can use the drone to recon stuff, and that kind of inherently requires it to be put to, at least potentially silent. Um, so how about we give it a fly speed of 25 feet and a walking speed of 10 feet. It's got little legs or little wheels that deploy, and it can just roll along the floor. If they really want it to be silent and stealthy, it can be. It's just going to be slow. And it's also going to be without the ability to fly. It's not going to be able to silently go up to the top of the skyscraper and figure out what's at the top before the players have the chance to be surprised by it. Nope, 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 nope. Maybe they can figure out some kind of Pac-Man-esque way to fly and roll this thing down air ducts, in which case that's going to be a session all by itself. Um, but now we've given it a silent option right out of the gate. It's just much less useful than the... Uh, well, well, we'll cut the price again. Uh, $350 upgrade I'm feeling pretty good about that I'm feeling pretty good about that how long have we been streaming for? about an hour 45 minutes let's keep going Okay, so now we've enabled some way to cast some form of illusions. We've added some corrosive in there, just for fun. Just for fun. I just had the idea, and I thought it'd be fun. Um, we have some solid snake-esque stealth fabrics, uh, some cat suits that we can wear. Now we have a reason to wear skin-tight cat suits, and I'm, I'm ready for that. I want that option to be there. I want skin-tight cat suit to be... Oh, you know what? This should be an armor. That's what this should be. This should not be a gambit. This should be an armor, because first of all, the person whom I'm assuming would like it the most is probably Abram. He can't cast gambits anyway, because he is a fighter. So this is not going to be a gambit. This is not going to be a gambit at all. No, no, no. This is going to be a form of armor. And it's going to be weaker. It's going to be favoring stealth over defense. That's what it's going to be.
Now, I don't really know what armor it is they already have, but I think what's going to end up happening is, um, uh, the, so far the, the, I don't, the, my, the players make their characters the way they want them to look pretty much right out of the gate because it's Dungeons and Dragons and they can do that and that's fine, but it does mean that, like, they don't, when they find, like, cool new armor or cool new clothes, Unless it has some kind of story meaning, they're very unlikely to want to wear it because it's not what they want their character to wear. If they wanted their character to wear that thing, they would have made their character wearing that thing from the get-go. That's just the way Dungeons & Dragons works. That's fine. That's totally understandable. And so to facilitate that, whenever I've wanted them to get better armor or to have the ability to spend their money on better armor, I've just made it in the form of upgrading their current clothes. Um, and so I think what's going to end up happening is that if they wear this... They have advantage on stealth checks, but they don't get the benefit of any of those upgrades that they have bought. And I don't know if that is enough of a deterrent. Because I don't know if they remember what, how many upgrades they've bought. So even if I told them, you don't get the benefit of your, of your upgrades anymore, they might go, okay, that's cool. How many upgrades did I get? And I might go, uh, I have absolutely no idea. So I think that this is just going to be a straight up modifier. And I'll put that on the bottom line, because that's where I like it to go. But AC... is going to be subtracted by... 3? At least 3. If not more. Advantage mathematically works out to be, on average, plus 5 to any given roll. So they'd be sacrificing 3 AC for plus 5 on something else. And I, I mean, I could just do the equation very, clear, very plain and simple. AC minus 5. And then you get plus 5 to stealth checks in the form of advantage. It's just a bit easier to compute. There's less math involved. If, if you can just re-roll the die, I feel like that's so much easier. It's just like a re-roll. Ah, easy peasy. Uh, plus 5. Okay, well, let me add my stealth modifier. And the plus 5. And the plus 5 from this magic item I have. And what's my, what's my base stealth? Oh, it's so confusing. Am I proficient? Oh, there's, there's like six things to add right there, so I'm not going to bother with that. We're just going to say advantage. You can just re-roll. Um, but I don't... I think AC minus 5 is too harsh. I think that the highest AC we have in the party right now is like 17. So that'd be 12. Which means that they would be getting hit often because enemies have modifiers too. They, they have a tendency to hit 12 fairly easily and pretty often. Um, so that would be pretty hardcore. But it would be even. It would be even. And I think I also like that because it feels more like a danger. It feels less like a... It's not like an outfit decision. Like, it's not a permanent character change. It's just a case of, well, you have to take off your armor and put on this armor. And so to that regard, you have to... You, you're, you're taking a risk. You have to go in stealthy and do something while you want the best stealth possible. It doesn't matter if you have minus 5 AC if you're never going to get hit, right? Allow the player to actively disappear into stealth even if they don't have normal skill. Um, you mean straight up like they can just fade into the thin air? Because this is almost like that. I feel like... Oh, you, you mean like they should be able to... Um, this allows you to take hide as a bonus action? AC minus 6? See, now the question... Do I... Have I created multiple items here? Should I make another item later that's like reactive fabric garment plus one allows you to take hide as a bonus action? AC minus six? I don't think so. I think I just want to roll up all the good ideas into one. It has to be a roll. Yeah, it would be a good roll. Oh, you mean like a whole new ability that's just straight up like roll to see if you can just fade into the ether before our very eyes. That sounds really cool, but I also think that that's the job of a other... Um, I think that's another item. I think that's another item in the, in the future. I think invisibility is something that we can we can manage and we can have, but it's going to be fucking costly. I think that that's going to be exorbitantly expensive because I do want... Uh, like, that's... Dungeons & Dragons has a condition called invisibility where you're just invisible, and that comes with it its own things that is... Like, you, you can't be hit. Like, no, but nobody can hit you. You have advantage on all of your attacks. Like, it's it's a both a debuff to your enemies and a buff to yourself is what invisibility is. 
allow the players to actively disappear into stealth even if they don't have normal skill. AC minus six. It has to be a roll. No, a special ability granted by the Garma. Well, is, I mean, plus five to a stealth check is already pretty fucking special if you ask me. Also, this does have story ramifications of, I, I mean, I have a description here to say, like, it changes color and texture, so if they, if they paint me a vivid word picture of how they smear the mud on their face and press their, their back up against the, the bark of the tree and cover themselves with, like, the, one of the branches of foliage as one of the watchmen comes sauntering past and peers at them for only a moment, and they keep their eyes shut and their, their mouth closed, and they are able to describe to me a vivid picture like that, like, then I might just let them have it for free, that, that, that stealth check. Um, going invisible isn't, isn't bonus, it is, it is your action. I, yeah, I just don't think I want to give them invisibility. I don't want to give them invisibility this early in the game. I say early, they're, they're like halfway done, I think, but. Hmm. How about hide, hide as a bonus action. Being able to hide as a bonus action is something that is unique to rogues usually, and it's something that is um, pretty powerful actually. Um, it's not quite invisibility, but it's like if you're in a packed warehouse full of crates. Oh, I'm running. I want to use my. I want to run. I want to use my action to dash, and I want to use my hide as a bonus action. And then suddenly we're we're in a potential uh, for bonus damage because if you're attacking someone from a hidden standpoint i try to I, it normally only rogues get um bonus damage if they're stealth when they attack somebody and i think that they do in hyper lanes as well but i think they just get a better so aurelio can just have like 2d6 as opposed to the others who can have an extra 1d6 um but i think i think hiding being able to hide as a bonus action doesn't sound as cool but i think functionally it's identical to to what you're describing the ability to simply fade into the environment this is just a skill-based thing instead of literally turning invisible um more Metal Gear Solid three esque, jumping into the trees, and suddenly the enemy can no longer track you because you're just too you're just too quick. But we'll come back to that other one later, because being able to turn invisible is something that would be fucking awesome. But I just don't think that's ready. Um, I don't think that this is the campaign. I don't think it's at a point yet for that. But I'm happy with the way that that is, and also it's minus five for now. We got how we do. Do we have enough drone upgrades? Are the drones cool enough yet? <clears throat> yeah, we'll add some quick stuff in there. Familiars in Dungeons and Dungeons Dragons usually have some kind of resistance to something, um, like magic, and that, and so I, and, but that's they, they have like 10 hit points, um. So we'll, uh... Oh, d damage. Damned. Uh, drone is given a reactive coating that gives it resistance to either heat or bolt damage. That way that if they want to spend the extra money on the drone, because the drone's pretty cheap so far. It's a pretty cheap drone. And we'll even cut the price of the silent running thing, because like uh having its range. Um and the fact that it can only fly twenty five feet. Like this isn't a Reaper. It's it's not like a plane that can fly halfway around the world. Um, so it being able to fly silently just gives it the potential to roll for stealth, but that doesn't that doesn't even mean it'll succeed. So like, yeah, we'll even cut that down to 200. We shouldn't have any upgrades that are more expensive than the thing that is, what, the, than the base thing. I'm iffy on that, um... If you're a warlock in Dungeons & Dragons, you can cast spells through your familiar. Which is a cool concept that, uh, honestly, I've never even really seen used. 
but I think it's a neat idea, so I want to put it in here. I'm not quite sure if I want to have that be part of the base drone's abilities. Um, especially since the drone can... <laughs> then I'd be able... Then I'd have... Okay, the worst case scenario is Nyx would be able to cast a grenade through the drone and blow something up, which admittedly doesn't quite appeal to me that much now that I think about it. Because I was just saying earlier that a 1d4 pistol is okay because that way they won't be able to like kill people at range by flying a drone up to their fucking apartment building and shooting them in their sleep um but suddenly if that drone can fly up to the apartment building and lob a grenade through the window uh that that's an issue um so i don't think i'm gonna let them be able to cast well i can just limit i can limit the school i can limit the school of gambit casting so um We uh well, splicing is just like computer based gambit, so like hacking or um software fixing or data mining, stuff like that. I feel like that's reasonable for the drone to be able to do. Engineering is like fixing stuff. I don't think that it necessarily has any destructive potential, but uh <laughs> Also, point of clarification is I think that the drone is basically going to operate on the person's turn who owns it. It's not going to have its own initiative. It's not going to take its own turn. Um, I think it's just going to be... Uh, um, I don't want it to be like the ranger's beast stuff because the beast stuff for the ranger in Dungeons & Dragons is kind of underwhelming. I don't like that you have to use your entire action to make your pet move. I think that's boring. It's like, okay, well, I'm just now I'm playing as two characters, except I only get to use one that I really like half the time. Um, so we'll just say it can be it can take actions as a bonus action on your turn. Um, I think looking through its eyes takes an action, and I think that they're blind. Meanwhile. because they're just focusing on what the drone is looking at. Maybe we should specify what actions the drone can take. The drone can take the move, hide, dash, Should it be able to take the assist action? I know how overpowered being able to take the assist action can be. Because it's basically advantage on every roll you make for the rest of the game. If you're using it in a scummy kind of way. Also, I don't really see how the drone can really assist that much anyway. Like a familiar in Dungeons and Dragons is like a creature with like arms and legs and a brain. Um, and a mouth, and can make noise, and can uh, sometimes even talk. But I don't think that the drone quite has that capacity. Uh, so we can take the move, hide, and dash action as a bonus action on your turn. Not just a bonus action, as your bonus action on your turn. Well, let's let's reclarify that. There you go. You may use your bonus action to command the drone to take the move, hide, or dash action. Hmm.
Now, if you want to cast a Gambit through the drone, I think it's going to cost your action and your bonus action because you usually need your bonus action to command the drone to do something. Oh shit, but you might need your bonus action to tell the drone to maneuver into the proper place to cast the Gambit. Alright, fine, it requires your action. But you still have your bonus action, I guess. Um, and then that way you could say like, okay, I'm gonna use my, I'm gonna use my action to cast the splicing gambit hack, and I'm gonna use my bonus action to move the quadcopter into the right position to initiate the gambit that it's about to cast, that I'm about to cast through it. Does that mean that the quadcopter can function as a security? Oh, fuck. Um, you can cast splicing and engineering gambits. All right, if the, the drone functions as a there, the drone functions as security tools if you're going to use it as Gambit. That way it can cast computer-based stuff and security tools-based stuff, um, which should make it so that you're not casting grenade through the drone, and it also should make it so that basically like subclasses. Oh, let me see here. AC... Six one. Have the drone super specialized, basically the subclasses. That's what I was thinking earlier. Um, and I have all these upgrades that seem to be kind of functioning in that regard. Like, um, maybe you, maybe the drone should only have two spots available for upgrades, so they have to pick between these five. They can have it silent and have a gun, but they can't have it. They can't speak through it, and it doesn't have resistance. If, if they wanted to make a battle one, a battle drone. Um, then they can take the damaging one, and then they can take the resistance one. But if they wanted to have like a drone that just like kind of helps them in battle, maybe they'd have the the the, the gambit drone with a metal metal chassis to like protect it a little bit better. Um, or if they just wanted to use it for like bullshit magic illusions shit, then they can make it run silently, and then they can speak through it, and then maybe they can fucking drape the holographic LED fabric over it so they can make it look like a, a ghost, and then they can speak through it and try and trick somebody into thinking that it's, it is what it isn't. Um, yeah, I think that that's I think that's pretty good. I think that is pretty good. That way we do have some subclasses in there. Um, but that just kind of implies to me now that if we're going to limit... Um, how many upgrades a drone can possess, then we should probably make some of these upgrades a little bit more powerful, because I kind of have been designing them with the intention that you're gonna, eventually you'll get them all. And that's why it only does 1d4 bolt damage. But if you can only pick two, and the like, I feel like Drone Gambit's a really good fucking one. Suddenly Metal Chassis doesn't really have as much ring to it. And the speaker also doesn't really have as much ring to it. Special upgrade, auto runner, makes the drone its own entity, like an animal familiar. Yeah, but you, then somebody still has to control it, in the sense of, like, a player still has to give it commands. I guess it would, like, have its own initiative at that point, so it would have, like, its own action and its own bonus action, but I don't... What, the, what can the drone do as a bonus action? Why does the drone need a bonus action? Normal usage of drones will take up your normal action. No, I don't want to do that because that's how the ranger functions with their beastmaster trait, and it was really it, it kind of sucked having to use your action to command your beast companion. Felt like you just like were, you were never doing anything because it was like, well, if I want to use my beast companion, I can't do anything as the cool ranger that I built, and if I want to do something as a ranger, then I can't use my beast companion because they're we share a turn if that makes any sense. So I really don't want to do that. I'll make. I think that the quadcopter requiring a bonus action. Um, is a better, is a good way to do it because the bonus action is really underused in my setting so far. There's not a lot of people who use the bonus action for anything, so I really want there to be more stuff to do on your bonus action. Because um, nobody, nobody dual wields except for Aurelio, and even he doesn't use it that often. And I think Abram has some stuff he can do as a bonus action, but like he can only do it so many times a day. And Nix, Nix, who's the wizard, Nix has nothing that she can do as a bonus action. So this is also kind of a way for me to populate the bonus action economy. I'm trying to in I'm trying to put some some stimulus package here in the bonus action. Cuz everything so far the drone's just the drone works even better than what you're describing right now. It doesn't require your normal action. It just requires your bonus action. It can it can only do one thing. It can only move, hide, dash, interact, 
or potentially shoot or cast a gambit, but it doesn't take your action. It just takes your bonus action. And I feel like that that functions... I think that functions better. Um, keep in mind also there's only three people in this party. If I was balancing this for like a, a more contemporary size, like maybe five people, I would say maybe, yeah, it should compete with your regular action. Um, but there's only the three of them. And so I really want them to be able to do more stuff on their turns. I'm, re I'm interested in seeing how, how do you feel about the, the drone only has two slots for upgrades and you have to pick two at any given time. How do we feel about that? If I'm going to do that, this, that changes a lot of stuff here. Suddenly the silent running drone shouldn't cost $200. They should all cost 100 And they should all be equal in terms of usefulness. If you're only allowed to take two. If you're allowed to take all of them, then I will adjust them accordingly to picture in my head what is the final form drone with all of the upgrades. Is that OP? No? Fine. Excellent. Um... Absolutely. Specialization. I like specialization. I like the idea of them customizing their own personalized drone that does its own special thing. Um, and I think that would be really cool. So I like this idea if it has two slots that are filled up with special specialties. It's going to be a, a very large um, description setting, though. A foldable drone with a fly, fly speed of 25 feet and a walking speed of 10 feet that can rudimentarily interact with the world using a single crab-like arm and an emotive LED face. You may use your bonus action to command the drone to take the move, hide, or dash action. I should probably... I don't think there's a such thing as the interact action in Dungeons & Dragons terminology. Um, but I'll put it in there just to kind of reiterate to my players that it can... it can What the drone can do is really just limited to your imagination. And so when I say interact, I just mean interact with the world at large. Uh, as an action, the player with a computer device can look through the drone's eyes. It has a dark vision of 15 feet. It has a range of 2 kilometers under ideal conditions. You are blind, meanwhile. I should apply that back up here. I should move around these th uh, s these to make more sense. I don't normally put anything in this final one, but I think I'm going to put some stuff in here. I think that this is what I'm going to do. I think I'm just gonna put the oh, I think I'm just gonna put the words upgrade slots. And then leave it up to them to interpret the fact that that means that they can fit upgrades in here. No shit. And by the way, if anybody has Microsoft Word that I can like have for free, that would be uh, fantastic. Ah, because as it stands, I'm like, uh, I'm trying to copy in chart boxes because this program that I'm using doesn't have them natively. Oh, look at that. I could just hit the enter button and generate one. Because here's what we're going to do. Now we have the drone upgrade section. And now hopefully this is self-evident. Normal action is six sections. Bonus is three seconds. Normal action is six seconds. But is that like official terminology from the from the Wizards of the Coast like book stuff? Normal action is six seconds. Bonus action is three seconds. Because if that's the case, that that's we're good. We're good then. That sounds perfect. Drone taking like three seconds to respond to a button pressed on your tablet uh, that's attached to your arm sounds like perfectly a okay to me. Um, but now that we're going to do some specializations, yeah, we definitely got to make this cost only 100. Whoops, it costs zero money, it's free. And now this needs to have the ability to play other... Now I can play sound effects at large, like bird chirping and stuff like that. I'll leave it up to them. I want the players to be able to use their imaginations. Um, 
Metal chassis. Um, I'm picturing now like a, I'm picturing like a battle drone. So maybe we maybe we should um maybe we bump up the battle drone potential damage to one d six. Uh, and the metal chassis also gives you uh also ups the AC of the drone to uh. What is an imp? What's an imp got? What's an imp got on its stats? An imp uh, familiar from the Dungeons and the Dragons. Imp familiar, 5e. An imp's got an armor class of 13. That, that sounds pretty okay. I think I'm actually going to make the armor class of the drone. Um Yeah, well we'll leave that as thirteen, actually. I feel like I don't I don't want them to, to be too afraid of their drone getting broken. I want them to have a kind of some faith in it. I want them to be able to count on it. Um I don't want them to just have like one I don't want the first first night out with the drone to be like, go do this thing and then like it gets hit by a fucking rocket and explodes like immediately and they're like just destroyed emotionally. Um, so we'll make its AC 13, and I'm okay with that, and I think that the battle drone feature, the metal chassis, will make it so that its AC is going to get bumped up. I think the AC is going to get bumped up to uh, something more. Uh, the AC... I don't want to change the hit points. I think I want to leave the hit points to be perfectly fine the way they are, and I'm just going to rely on the chance of... does it like If it gets hit, it gets destroyed, essentially. So I think the AC... is going to become, like, like, at least 16. Because I don't want the player character who buys the drone to have to be keeping track of two HP, two different HP amounts, because it's already difficult to keep track of your own HP and your own AC and your own hit points and, or your, and your own uh, spell slots and how much damage your weapons do. So no, I don't want to give them too much paperwork. So I think I'm just going to leave the health pool as 10, and I'll just count on the... Uh, I'll just let it be like if it, if it gets hit, if it gets hit, um, with like 16 AC, like 17 AC potentially, it's toast. It's probably going to receive 10 points of damage. Anything that could hit it handily for 16 points of damage is probably just going to toast it. But that's fine because we've already established that if it's get if it gets down to zero HP, it's not destroyed. You can repair it. You just have to, have to spend a short rest and you have to succeed on an intelligence save. Or a wisdom check. So um, I'm pretty okay with this. I don't want it to be too robust. I, I like the idea of them having a reoccurring. Uh, it's dramatic. It's dramatic when this thing gets hit, when it explodes, when it when it's ripped apart by gunfire, and they watch in horror as their robotic friend is destroyed. I I, I want them to have it. Uh, I don't want this invulnerable droid. Um, so we'll we'll uh, we'll bump that down to 15. Actually, I think like 15 is like a bugbear. Like, so it's not like that's... <laughs> it's not really that much easier, to be honest. So that feels pretty good. That feels... Now it's, like, on on point. So now we got, like, different drones. We have a... I can feel, like, this speaker drone. Um, silent and speakers, like, um, some real sneaky shit can be done with that. Some real sneaky, shitty recon. Um, the metal chassis really bumps up its combat ability, especially since it has resistance to heat or bolt, which are really the only two damage types besides physical in this game. I think I have, um, technically there's also radiation, um, but robots are immune. And then, of course, there's the physical types of, uh, slash, impale, and bludgeon, or blunt, or pierce, I don't even know what the other one is called. This feels good. I'm feeling good about this. This is a uh... here. I'll I'll even let them choose uh, bolt or fire. Oh, I mean heat. Whoops. Um, he because uh, you might get hurt by you. You could be damaged by heat that doesn't necessarily come from a fire in this setting. It could be like like lasers do heat damage. Um, heated swords do heat damage.
And I have to keep this in mind because this is also the equivalent of saying, hey, as long as your drone exists, you are able to use your bonus action to do 1d6 extra damage every turn on your turn. Um, which is the same as just giving somebody a weapon buff. That, uh, that A weapon buff whose limit is limited by the existence of this, this quadcopter's existence. Uh, and we also we'll give it a battery life of one day, so they can't just leave it someplace. They can leave it overnight someplace, like uh, it's a twenty-four hour period. So if they were if they wanted to stake out someplace, but they didn't want to use their uh, another thing I've been really feeling in this campaign is that um, they've had a lot of places that they they wish they could have been in, even though they cannot exist in two places at the same time. Uh, so giving them a familiar in the form of a drone, I feel like it's going to alleviate... Damn, that's a long battery life. Yeah, I know. Batteries are good in this setting, man. So this is the future, baby. Um, some stuff is okay in terms of technological advancement, and some stuff is just kind of like modern-day mundane levels. Um, I'm going to say that the quadcopter, they, they, spent, they spent a lot of fucking time um, on battery life. This is a Lunaris custom drone. This thing has got the, the best of the best. Uh, does it need stats? Does the drone need stats? Does the drone need a strength, dexterity, constitution? My answer is no. I don't think that it does need those things. I feel like I would just let it... <laughs> yeah, absolutely, it does need stats. What stats would we give it? I feel like it would just be like 10 across the board. It would just be like a flat die roll of like, roll me a d20 and we'll see if this thing accomplishes anything of value. Um, and then I think maybe the silent running drone will actually be the thing that bumps up its stealth modifier. So everything is a just, I think everything should just be base 10. I'm not going to make the, I'm not going to make the drone roll a constitution modifier. And because it's probably going to be te not literally tethered, but it's going to be tethered to an in to an NP a PC, it's going to be a player character's responsibility to keep track of this thing. I think that that should mean that the player character's stats should determine its survivability, because the player character is the one who's been taking care of it. So I think that I should ask the player to roll a dexterity saving throw for your drone, because you've been taking care of it. You've been telling it where to go and how to maneuver, so it's really your dexterity modifier and your planning that's determining its survivability. So I think I'm just going to let the, the player's stats dictate the stats of the drone, except for things like strength. Machines have high constitution? I mean, you're right. I mean, the machine's already immune to most of the status defects. Um in this game like it's not going to get the things that you would have to roll constitution for are stuff that are environmental hazards or poisoning or me like drinking alcohol or uh resisting poison maintaining concentration surviving the vacuum of space resisting weather and all of those things are things that robots are already immune to in the setting so that just that just tells me again like that i don't the thing it doesn't need a constitution modifier because it doesn't ever need to roll constitution it's it's immune to everything that could it could ever need to roll constitution for I think I'm even okay. I was going to say one of the upgrades could actually be operate in the vacuum of space, but I think I'm just going to let it out. I think I'm just going to let it be okay in space. Don't ask me how it moves because helicopter blades don't work in space. But you know what? <laughs> we can have a little bit of funsies. All right, so the reactive fabric is now... We, we have some clothing choices. Some, something that I'm trying to give opportunities where the AC of my players can get knocked down a peg, because lately it's just been nowhere but up. They've just been getting upgrades, 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 and more and more AC, and now I'm trying to give them a reason as to why they would want to knock it down. Because I kind of missed the point of that when I first started this campaign. Uh, like... Um, it's, I feel like this is not really paid attention to a lot, but uh, armor and... Dungeons and Dragons has a lot of modifiers 
and a lot of like terminology connected to it that just doesn't really get read by a lot of players. Like plate mail, for example, you have disadvantage on stealth with plate mail, and I don't think I think DMs know that. I don't think players know that. And so I've been giving my I've been giving my players uh, AC equivalents to like medium armor, but without any of the deficits of wearing medium armor. Um, so like they haven't had disadvantage on stealth because they they're wearing scale armor. They haven't had any disadvantage. They, they're I think heavy armor is like you you you're slowed. Like I think you have twenty five feet movement per turn if you have like full mega plate mail armor on. Like, unless you have proficiency, maybe I, I don't even know if proficiency alleviates that. I think you're just permanently slow. Um, and so that's stuff that just hasn't really been in my campaign, and I'd like it to be in my campaign. So I'm trying to add in places where I've got, like, um, I think that we're going to add in heavy armor. And it's going to be different, because, like, like I said, my players have had situations where they can upgrade their armor, and they have gambits that give them kind of, like, buffs, like temporary hit points and stuff like that. AC benefits. Um, but we haven't had anything that's just straight-up armor differences. So let's get some of that biznatch in here. Hmm. And I suppose if one costs three hundred dollars, the other one should cost three hundred dollars as well. And as much as I like the idea of introducing new armor and outfits for the players to wear, I I know that they like what they like. So I think I'm still going to make this in the form of an upgrade, quote-unquote. It's just also going to have some kind of deficit to it, just like how there's a minus AC thing for the uh, stealth garment. I'll put stealth right in the name so they know what it's all about. And this, this one's going to have defense in the name so they know what that one's about, too. Um, yeah. <clears throat> we'll call it plate inserts so that they can kind of picture how they like to do it they can either just wear it over their clothing or they could try to put it underneath their clothing either way I'm not going to say that it's concealable it is not going to have the concealable tag if they want they could be like well I, I, I put it inside my jacket I'll be like yeah sure and they'll be like, okay. So I, I look the same. And I'll be like, yep. And then they'll say, but does that mean that I can conceal it? And I'll say, nope. <laughs> it, it will not hold up to scrutiny. Uh, heavy duty ceramic plates inserts ready for defense, even against rifle fire. Uh, and all this is going to be is it's just going to be a plus one AC armor. And it's going to, uh, but it's going to make you slow. And I think that that is fair. In fact, that might not, that might even not be, f uh, it, it might need it might need to be a real harsh movement penalty because I've had a lot of issues where uh, players it's not their fault but my encounters are kind of like in these real world scenarios not really in dungeons necessarily um, where movement hasn't really been that big of a deal like uh, positioning and whatnot so like how far they can move in one turn but uh, really what this is, is just, it's a challenge for me. It's, it's a challenge for me to make more exciting, interactive encounters. Um, so we'll, we'll do that in every instance rate against rifle fire. So I think that their AC is the highest it can be without starting to make some sacrifices. I think one of them has like 18 AC, which is like, that's plate mail. That's, that's a paladin in heavy armor. Um, but they don't suffer any of the detriments of heavy armor because it's in the form of these upgrades. So I'm going. This is that's as high as they're getting. And if they if they want to get higher, then that's fine. But it's gonna now we're gonna start feeling the costs. Um, so it is AC plus uh, AC plus two. It's a ten percent damage reduction. Um, but your movement speed is. Um, Halved only makes sense for some of them because I think one of them has an innately an innately higher movement speed. No, he can just use dash as a double action. Okay, it comes down to should I make it so they can only travel three squares or four squares?
Okay. I think that that's fine. I still want them to be able to move. I want the, I want it to still be enticing. Um, so this is not that harsh of a penalty. Um, and if it also if it's halved, if they ever have any item that gives them more movement speed, um, even if it's like for a single turn, like an ability or uh, some kind of um, drug or, or some kind of other like exceptional circumstance where their speed ends up becoming um, multiplied or whatever like that, uh, if this is a subtraction based uh, debuff as opposed to a division based debuff, uh, when they get that boost, whatever that boost is, they'll they'll feel it more. They'll they'll get that rush um, if it's subtraction based because this won't hurt as hard. If their speed is doubled for a turn, and this subtracts only ten, then they still get fifty feet of movement. Like that's a lot of movement still. If this said movement speed was halved, and they got uh, a, some kind of ability that multiplied their speed by two for a turn, then then this that just means that they only get to experience normal speed because <laughs> their movement would be doubled and then halved so they wouldn't experience the buff it would just be moving them from 15 feet up to 30 feet for a turn which is a, a real kicker really and it, that just sounds depressing so i'm not going to do it i'm just going to make it be subtraction based we'll just have a minus 10 well 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 we added a laser pen i don't, I don't know if it really got enough Ooh, you know what? I don't even know if Mr. Bunny in there is still in the chat or not. Uh, but I, uh, he was talking about, like, oh, joking about, like, don't look at it, it might cause blindness. I think that's going to be the point of this laser pen. Also, I don't know if he meant a laser pen like a laser pointer or like a pen with a laser built into it, but I think that this is fine. Um, I'm going to say may, may cause blindness, and I'm just going to slide that in as kind of like a ha-ha funny thing, but I'm also going to let that be a case of maybe the NPC, the players, not the NPCs. I think the players might learn, like, wait, if we hold this tiny blowtorch up against someone's face, we can blind them for a minute, <laughs> which is a powerful debuff that I think that they would get a kick out of, so I'll, I'll actually put that in. Um, because I like it when the players are, like, using their noggins, and they're like, wait, this causes this? Does that mean I can use it offensively? And I, hopefully I'll have thought of it and go, yes, that sounds fascinating, and hopefully it's not something I did not, did not think of. For example, if they just try to throw this corrosive at somebody, how much damage is it going to do? Uh, one time you said I'm a high-powered industrial solvent. If it can eat through, like, wood in a minute, then it's probably fucking devastating, so it probably does, like... <laughs> Uh, 3d6 I think 3d6 is like a real powerful spell like fireball I think does like around 3d6 so I think like this corrosive acid um, just fucking eating through someone uh, and doing like 3d6 damage is perfectly okay what is that what's the average of 3d6 that'd be 3.5 times 3 right 3.5 times 3, so it'd be like 10 damage. So it's like, I can estimate that they'll do 10 damage to somebody in one turn. That's no more damage than they couldn't have already done anyway with their normal weapons and abilities, so. <gasps> Ooh, I just got a good idea. Mmm. I'm gonna, instead of making this a guaranteed two feet, I'm just gonna make it a fucking 1d4. It's gonna create a hole. Uh, the, create, the hole created is no bigger than 1d4 feet. Uh, deep? Wide, tall, all three of those things. In dimensions. I like that. So now that now this has become a thing where um, they might <laughs> they might throw the acid against the wall, and it might only eat through one foot, and they can only reach their arm in to try and grab something on the other side, or they can fit their drone in. Um, but it might melt up to four feet, and then they can just crawl right on in easy peasy. Um, and and that also I'm going to let that control how deep. 
the material will be. Uh, one moment, please. Um, actually, you know what? I think the stream is going to come to an end soon. I'm going to officially close this out in just a minute, though. All right, just had to let the girlfriend in to the locked door. So let's finish this up. We have corrosive, and not just any corrosive, industrial. Corrosive. Should this Am be I from a place? No, you're not. Oh, okay, bye. <laughs> uh, one time use item, high powered. Uh, could eat through 1d4 feet in dimensions, can vary depending on imperial. Um, and I also mean that in case of 1d4 feet wide, tall, and deep. So they might throw it against a wall and it might melt through one foot, but if it's deeper, if it's like stone, um, which is like a stone column, like up to like th three feet wide. Like it, it might not eat through all of it. Um, I think that that's very interesting. And now that that's like that, I'm, I, there's going to be some kind of limit on this. Either I should make it more expensive or I should make so only so many in the inventory for them to purchase. Probably just going to make it more expensive though. Um, because I don't want to have to remember how much stuff they have bought in, in the inventory of the store. That's annoying. I don't like to do that. I'd rather just count on chance to keep track of all my stuff. Um, for example, bullets in this setting. Like, I used to make them keep track of every individual bullet that they fired, but it was like nobody could remember how many they shot or how many they started with or how many they bought. And so I just said, you know what? Fuck it. You carry, like, you can carry up to three magazines, and if you roll up, if you critically fail an attack action, you're out. That magazine's out. So you have three failures, and then your gun is out. Because three magazines is much easier to keep track of than 37 bullets. Um, and I like the same thing happening with a lot of other stuff, too. Like the drone. Like, it's got 10 HP, but, like, I don't want to have to keep track of that. Nobody probably will, wa will want to keep track of that. Maybe I'll ask them if they want to keep track of that. But I'd rather it just be based around its AC. If it gets hit, it's going to fucking die. Maybe it won't die in one turn, but it's going to die in, like, no more than three turns so the so if i'm attacking the drone the player will not have to worry about the drone for more than three turns just let the chance just let the chance the probabilities let it take care of everything also we play dungeons and dragons to roll dice and feel um feel chance taking the wheel you know so it's not like i i don't think anybody opposes to this design philosophy of just let chance take care of it Yeah, she's okay with it, and she's one of the players. That's Nick's in the background. Hi! Yeah, do whatever you want to do. Um, but I think that this is going to come to an end. It's been two hours and 35 minutes. The stream is already long enough, and I've already had two false starts, so I think I'm going to end while it's strong. We've made... How many? How much shit have we made? One, two... I can't count. I hate this system so much. Um, <clears throat> one, two... Three, four... Ugh! Uh, five, six, and then seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, eleven things. About a dozen, give or take. I probably miscounted because I can't scroll on this. Um, but that sounds pretty good. That's a good evening, and these are some pretty strong stuff too. So I don't think that we're gonna have any issue with this. Uh, holographic LED fabric. That's just gonna. That's just gonna be broken if it takes any damage. Because I don't want to have to keep track of that ever. And uh, it's so cheap that they can just buy another one if they really have an issue with it. And that being said, I will make it slightly cheaper than I was planning to, because it would be difficult to uh, replace. And I don't want. I don't want industrial corrosive to become a permanent fixture in their inventories. Um, so we're going to up the price of that as well. I don't want them to always be like, well, let's just use our one industrial corrosive for the day. Um, because they have five, uh, I'd rather they spend the money on like health potions and stuff like that. Uh, if, I, I want them to maybe buy one, one or two, but I don't want to have to worry about it. I destroy the space station. Yeah, I don't want you to do that either. So I'll, maybe I'll adjust the prices on my own later. But for now, this is the rough estimates. This is pretty good. I'm, I'm pretty satisfied with this. Um, so yeah, this has been a pretty great stream. I'm going to save this, and I am going to go. It's been a pleasure. Y'all have a great night.